Welcome everybody to the meeting of the City Council for Tuesday, August 16th, 2022. Ms. Hilbrick, will you please call roll? Councilman De La Garza? I am present. Councilwoman Solis? Here. Councilman Crocker? Here. Councilwoman Scott? Here. Mayor Pro Tim Young? Here. Councilman Lofgren? Here. And Mayor Bachne? Here. Um, before we start the pledge, and I know we have a moment of silence, some use it for silent reflection or prayer. And I just want to say that we lost a dear friend this week. Um, Mr. Jack Morrison passed away, and he was a great community member, a great friend of many, and just keep, you know, his family and y'all's thoughts and prayers, please. And with that, we'll stand up, say the pledges, and then followed by a moment of silence. Thank you. All right, again, welcome. Uh, any announcements and or reminders, Mr. Garza? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. We do have a couple of staff announcements this evening, and, and I'm going to uh, solicit a little bit of assistance with these. So I want to first ask uh, Ken Gill to come up and provide an update on our drought contingency plan. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, just want to give you a brief update of where we are with the drought, as you know. It's continuing. The upstream of Victoria, Guadalupe River, it still hasn't received any rain, and it continues to drop. Want to announce that we're going to enter into stage three beginning tomorrow. Uh, some of the changes in stage from stage two to stage three, I want to you know emphasize is that watering hours remain the same, but one of the big restrictions is. We want to do even number, if you have an even number address, watering on Sundays and Thursdays. Odd numbers are Saturdays and Wednesdays. Uh, and one point to make, that does include commercial properties. It's, it's, a lot of people have asked, is commercial exempt or not? No, it includes commercial as well as residential. Uh, some of the other ones is restaurants may not serve water unless requested by the patron. We're going to try to get out in front of the restaurants, those that, that have the sit-down restaurants, to see if we can notify them, at least get them you know, up to speed on what our restrictions are. And the golf courses, as you well know, they're, they're not, they won't be allowed to water. All our golf courses are on private water wells, so those won't be affected. So if you see watering at the, at the golf courses, it's, it's done privately. Uh, some of the things that we're doing proactively is we're putting door hangers as we were out and about, and we see somebody watering outside the times. We knock on the door, ask the citizens, hey, we explain we're under drought conditions. Please limit your watering times, and if they're not home, we'll put the door hanger on it. Uh, the restriction is because the OCR, the off-channel reservoir number eight, is dropping, and when it gets at elevation 42 or 50%, that's when we want to get into the, the restriction number three. Uh, we are ordering water from Canyon Lake. We have one that water right, so we're getting some water in from Canyon to put as much water as we can into those OCRs for the next 13 days. And really, that's all I just wanted to inform council before we got this out. We need to set up any transfer pumps from OCR to OCR? We already have those out. They're working on getting, <clears throat> they're putting the one up from OCR. The water comes in at OCR number four. It does have a channel between four and eight where we draw the water from eight to the plant. We're having a transfer pump going from those over to uh, OCR number six, which is a big one. And we're gonna fill that one up. Okay. Is there any restrictions on car washes? Car washes are still allowed to commercial car washes because a lot of people think they use a lot of water. They really don't. And a lot of it, some of it is recycled. 
homes, it's the same restriction, positive shutoff. And you can water your grass using, you know, as long as you're holding the water hose, you can water any time during the day. And we do encourage, of course, you know, keep your foundations moist, use a soaker hose. Those work great. Keeps that evaporative moisture from just disappearing. And um, splash pads, recycled also. The which ones? Splash pads. Yes, those are all recycled. All our splash pads are recycled water. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. All right. Next up, I want to ask uh, <clears throat> Tiffany Tota to come up and provide an update on our child safety grant program. Good evening. I just wanted to remind uh, council and the public that child safety grant applications are now open. They opened on Monday and will be open through September the 2nd, close of business. Um, so 5 p.m. are when applications are due. Um, we will host three applicant workshops during the duration of the application timeframe for potential applicants to attend and get more information about the program. Uh, additionally, um, those applications can be found at victoriatx.gov forward slash child safety program, and questions can be directed to CS program at victoriatx.gov. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Tota. All right, if there's no other ones, we'll go to public and employee recognitions. For this item, Ashley is going to help me uh, present this item and present a few of our distinguished citizens. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. I am so excited to present our recognition tonight to six outstanding and what we're going to call distinguished citizens. They have taken so much time and energy out of their busy schedules, I'm sure, to invest their time to really get to know not only city officials, but what it is that we're doing here to better enhance the livability in our community. And that's so important. You and I and our staff up here see day in and day out all the projects, efforts, initiatives that we work so hard to move in enhancing livability. And to have our residents as part of that effort and getting to know what we're doing and share that with the community is so important. And so um, one of the other things that we want to have as a result of this program, and not only one, by the way, we have Citizens Academy, which is four weeks this year, and then we also have the Police and Fire Academies, and those are ranging from six weeks to 11 weeks, all free and all educational. But at the end of the day, one of our goals ultimately is to increase citizen engagement, get them involved, maybe through volunteer opportunities or serving on local boards and commissions. And so we're excited about that opportunity, excited to stay involved and just connected with each other, with our community. And so let me read this to you and then we'll bring them up. The following group of residents graduated from three of our city hosted educational programs that are designed to engage our residents and promote good citizenship. For example, Citizens Academy, which is hosted by my team, is a four-week educational program featuring leaders from various city departments and partner organizations discussing the ins and outs of city government. It even included a Q&A with our council members. That was awesome. And even featured our city manager, Jesus Garza. In addition, the city hosts the Police Academy, which is an 11-week program, and Fires Civilian Responder Academy program, which I believe is six weeks. They feature the ability to repel off of a building. How cool is that? I'd be terrified, but you know, I had an excuse this past year. Kudos to you guys. And they even get to use the jaws of life on a vehicle. We are proud to say that six of our participants from all three of those programs will be graduating from all of them. So without further ado, Mayor, would you come up and I'll call each one by name and you guys can come up in order that I call you. The city of Victoria affirms that Dr. Joanne Olson Carl Westbrook, Joseph Geisman, Zachary Wendell, Alfred Reinhardt, and Megan Schultz have completed Citizens Academy. Yes, go ahead and stand up here. We want to see you on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we got photos. Have completed Citizens Academy, the Civilian Police Academy, and the Civilian Fire Academy Civilian Responder Program, and are hereby granted the title of Distinguished Citizen in recognition of outstanding citizenship, commitment to self-improvement, and dedication to our Victoria community. Conferred this 16th day of August 2022. Let's give them all a round of applause. We would be remiss, we would be remiss if we didn't give them the opportunity to say a few words. I know a few have expressed interest. Is that okay, Mr. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Feel, feel free to uh, return to your seats um, and or line up at the podium if you'd like to say a few words. And as you do that, I want to briefly um, announce, too, 
that we are going to be creating a Citizens Academy Alumni Association with the intent to keep the over 100 individuals that have gone through this program through its history um, involved and engaged. And so we envision every October having a luncheon with the members of the uh, Citizens Academy Alumni Association, walking them through the budget that was recently adopted, upcoming projects. Um, these are obviously residents in our community that are super eager to be engaged and know what's going on and quite frankly serve as champions of ours out on the streets. And so we want to make sure that they have the tools and the information in order to keep doing that. Um, and so thank you in advance, because I <clears throat> hope to see all of you there. Um, but with that, please. I just want to say that I encourage everyone to do it. You know, when, when, the, when it came around and I had a church member friend that went to the police academy, and he just kept telling me over and you got to go, you got to go. You got to see that guy get tased. That is just really, <laughs> that's really neat, you know. And you get to go out to the academy and you get to shoot, you know, that nine millimeter pistol out there at the academy. And then most of you, a lot of you probably know Diana Rhodes. She's a church member also. And she just kept going on and on and on. Now, it's hard to tell Diana, you know, no, that I don't want to do this, you know. So I finally gave in. And when I did, I really did enjoy it. And that prompted me to go to the next step. And they're all great. They're all wonderful. I encourage everybody to participate. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I were facing the other direction because I'd like to look each one of you in the eye and say this is well worth your time, effort, and energy. Thank you to the city council, to the police department, to the fire department for doing these things. These, they they've, have been great. Just to clear the air, I was not tased, and I don't plan on being tased. But every effort that, it, the program itself was very good, but I was impressed with our people. Folks, you got to know we've got some good people leading in these areas in our community life. I want to thank the city council, thank the fire department, the police academy for all that they've done. Keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I pulled into town almost exactly 10 years to this day. Pulled into town 10 years ago, and my first thought was, wow, Texas is really hot <laughs> because I'm from Wisconsin. And in the last few weeks, I've been reflecting, like, I never expected this. I never thought that. I never, and quite honestly, had never thought about any of the things that I've learned. So throughout these three academies, I've shot a gun, used a fire extinguisher, rappelled down a building, learned about public works, and a whole bunch of other things. Went on a ride along and really, really appreciated it. I remember the very first week at the police academy, I, I raised my hand and I said, well, what's in it for you? to the officers doing this presentation. And they said, what we get is engaged citizens who understand what we do. And so for a while, I've been that annoying person that says, don't you know about this? Or well, look, when they're at the stop sign, they're doing that. And this is what it's like to rappel down a building. So thank you for the opportunity to be engaged in lifelong learning in this way. Right. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I have one recognition. It's not really public or employee. I had the uh, privilege of being asked to go to meet the West Warriors event last night. And at that, uh, Victoria West was very uh, fortunate. They made um, the cover of Dave Campbell's Texas Football, which is a big deal. They did 12 schools throughout the state uh, with commemorative covers. And so our Victoria West High School is on one of the covers. And um, I don't know how you get another copy, but um, I thought it was very, very neat. And I uh, appreciate them inviting me and let me be part of that. So. Fantastic. I'll pass that around to you all. Um, with that, we'll close public and employee recognitions. And I'm going to switch it up. Um, I think we're going to do citizens communication before we have our discussion. Um, I can see it both ways. Either you'll love our discussion or don't like the discussion and still want to make comments, or we need to hear your comments and take them into consideration as we have our discussion. So we're going to have citizens communication first, um, and we're going to start with Michael Vondera. Good evening, council and manager. And, uh, just want to uh, thank uh, Chick-fil-A for the free cookies. Uh, <coughs> 
last two weeks. I appreciate it. Very good. And uh, we have a problem of uh, loose pit bulls running uh, at the trailer park. One was trying to get up uh, up my steps, but he didn't realize I added four two-by-fours, and he couldn't make it, but he gave it a shot. He did chase off the Meals on Wheels lady that was bringing uh, free dog food and stuff, and uh, uh, I would like animal control to get involved. I did talk to them. They didn't come by. I talked to them yesterday, and they said they can put me on a list for a trap. It'll probably be about six weeks, you know, at best, if I, you know, push it at the commissioner's court and talk to Judge Zeller and stuff. You know, they'll eventually break down and give it. Uh, I do wish they had some kind of trap program where you could get one at a reasonable time. Um, I guess the city... Uh, uh, it's going to have to be responsible for them. You know, the city council going to have to have traps at the police station or something for us since animal control just can't get enough. And um, also, uh, Juan Hernandez, he's the senior animal control officer. He did catch one of these uh, pit bulls, and um, he did give him a ticket, and that was on 2203 East North Street. He didn't pay it, so he's got two warrants for his arrest. And uh, uh, a police officer did give a ticket to Trailer 2 a couple years ago. I appreciate it. He didn't pay it, and he's got a warrant for his arrest. And um, on Trailer 27, uh, they chained the dog, which is illegal. There's the Safe Outdoor Acts, but I'm not bothering animal control with it because they just hired two new people, and they probably have to train them and uh, learn the law. But in like about a year from the law and stuff, I'll expect them to all know it and stuff like that. And on the Victoria Appraisal District, what they're doing, uh, they don't call it an audit. They try to trick and confuse you and call it a stopgap analysis, kind of like the war in Ukraine. There's no war. It's a special military operation and stuff. But when they say stopgap analysis, that's another word um, of an audit. They try to trick and confuse you. But one of the things they're doing, if you own a trailer house, they um, – it automatically goes up three, 4,000, sometimes three times as much as when it was. And I'm not just talking about people that live in there. I'm talking about landlords. You know, their trailer houses, they own maybe four or five, and they're renting them, and their value decreases every year. But the Victoria Appraisal District is uh, raising them, and I don't know why they do it on trailer house. And uh, it's not just for... Um, Oh, okay. Well, that's it. Have a good day. Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ronderell. Have a good day. All right. Uh, I forgot to make my announcement. Three minutes on the citizens' comments, um, and there should be a little timer up there if you have any question where you are on time, and uh, we'll gavel you if, if you go over or if you can't wrap up quickly. So, Miss Brenda Brooks first. Good evening. I am Brenda Brooks. I would like to share a few of my thoughts concerning the development of the library collection policy. The purpose of the policy as taken from their draft is to support the mission, the goals, and philosophies of the Victoria Public Library. What is the mission statement? They crossed out the current one. More important, supporting the goals and philosophy of the Victoria Public Library and not the goals and philosophies of this community seems to be a red flag. Affirm that the library is a forum for information and ideas that follow guiding principles based on intellectual freedom. What or who are the guiding principles, and what is intellectual freedom? Remember, we're talking about children. They cite Library Bill of Rights, the Freedom to Read Statement, and the Freedom to View Statement, all developed by the American Library Association. This is a group based in Chicago that may or may not reflect this community's values. I'm a retired educator. I have given many years to educating and working with children of all ages. 
It would be nice to enjoy my golden years, barefoot on sandy beaches, delighting in the color schemes of the sunsets, or even enjoying the solitude of a mountain getaway. But you see, I have a special love for children, and I feel a real urgency about protecting their innocence. I have grandchildren and even a great-grandchild, and I'm concerned about the world that we're leaving them. In fact, I feel angry about the injustice, unjust attacks on our children, and the, and the following gave me a certain amount of comfort. Thomas Aguinas, a 13th century Italian priest and immensely influential philosopher, made this statement. He who is not angry when there is just cause for anger is immoral. Why? Because the anger looks to the good of justice. And if you can live amid injustice without anger, you are immoral, as well as the unjust. You can be angry and sin not. Anger is, at injustice is righteous anger. It is not loving to wink at injustice. It is loving to resist it. Ms. Brooks, if you could wrap it okay. up real quick. Thank We're you. at war for the souls of our children. And I will use my voice. If that's all I can do, I can at least use my voice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Peggy Hester. Mayor Bachnight, City Council members. My name is Peggy Hester. My husband and I have lived in Victoria for 44 years. We've raised six children here, and we have nine grandchildren. When our children were young, we spent many happy hours in the library choosing books to read with them. I did not have to worry that my children would open a book with explicit pictures of sexual activity as they searched for books about horses or the beach or Winnie the Pooh or castles and knights, to name a few. Unfortunately, that protection for our children is gone. I was unaware of this until earlier this year when I saw and read some of the books while visiting the library with my daughter and my grandchildren. If others saw the, this material, they too would be shocked and concerned over what is being offered to our children. The library director and staff have chosen to allow books with explicit images and graphic descriptions of sex to be put on the shelves in the picture book, juvenile, and young adult, 17 and under sections. According to the library's collection development policy, quote, the ultimate responsibility for material selection rests with the library director who delegates the responsibility for the selection of materials and development of the collection to library staff members, quote. To whom are they responsible? To whom do they answer for the choices they make? Air and exercise promote physical health and strength. Our food becomes muscle and bone and blood. Books and the ideas within them are the food for our mind. We should be wise in choosing the food we give our minds. It has been said, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Or put another way, bad company ruins good morals. What company are these obscene books providing? Romans 13.4 says, For he or she, regarding a governing authority, is God's servant for your good. Thank you for your concern over the age and content inappropriate materials at our library and thank you for doing all that you can to correct this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hester. <laughs> Ms. Jenny Stafford.
Good to see you. Hey there. It's good to see you. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. So I am here to talk about bullying. Uh, if, if you are a victim of insomnia like me, you may see the, all the uh, PSAs on TV at night, the little girl who's wearing glasses and she's getting picked on at school. Or uh, there was another one by some uh, movie stars and uh, those big shots saying, if you see something, say something. And I had about talked myself out of speaking today and then I was reading my magazine this morning because we didn't get the advocate. And right is an ad that says, if you see something, say something. So that's what I'm doing. I also want to say something because I have maintained my certification as a prevention specialist. It's something that I've earned 20 some odd years ago. And I did that because I care about kids. And I believe there are risk factors that make kids' life even more dangerous and perilous than it has to be. And I'm concerned about a group of kids that identify as lesbian, gay, transgender, questioning, whatever they are, but they don't fit the mold that we think that they should fit. And I'm concerned about this group because they may not, we may not consider it bullying, but they may feel targeted with some of the ways that our community has responded to them. When you think about uh, the platform that one of the major parties has taken about abnormal behavior, when you think about uh, maybe some of the things our governor has said about medical care, when you think about things within our own community about gay pride, those are the kind of things that damage what kids think about themselves, especially when they're in a place of questioning. People in power, such as you, who sit in places to make high decisions, their words make a difference on how people feel about themselves. Words I heard today when I talked to some friends were that they feel unwelcome, they feel left out, they feel alone, and they feel that there's something wrong with them. The really scary thing about this are the statistics. The most recent statistics about youth who identify as LGBTQ, 10% say they've been threatened or injured at school. 34% say they've been bullied at school. 28% say they've been bullied electronically. And here's the one that'll keep you up tonight. 33% say they have attempted suicide. Not thought about it, but they've attempted suicide. And you compare that with 6% of heterosexual youth. That's a very scary number. And it shows you the, the place that they are in their head. The other thing we know is they are at greater risk of depression, of self-harm, and of substance abuse, all ways of dealing with their anxiety. So the only encouragement I have for you is that the decisions that you make and the words that you use are felt and heard throughout the community. I implore you to be thoughtful and measured when you make decisions, whether they're about books or festivals or policies. Anything that you say, I want you to think about how that's going to be heard by a young person struggling with their identity. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Laura Mamina. You might have to repeat that. Okay. So not speaking into the microphone. It happened as claps were going, so it's hard oh. to hear. Is it Laura Mamina? That's it. Um, thank you to the mayor and the city council for letting me speak. I didn't prepare anything um, today, but I'll just speak from um, my heart. Um, I would second what the last uh, speaker said. Um, I am a uh, historian of the United States. My research focuses on gender and sexuality and race and ethnicity in the United States. Um, I can tell you from the work that I do with the students at the University of Houston, Victoria, that many of them um, do not feel safe in this community. And many of those students are students who are LGBTQ. I will be teaching a class this fall on sex and society in the United States, talking to my students about how those ideas have developed and changed over time. The work or the, the things that are said about LGBTQ people um, have an impact on our students, on our ability to recruit students, on our ability to keep students here um, and to keep you know, young people within this community. I know that there is language going around saying, you know, we're trying to protect children. Well, as far as I know, none of these picture books or young adult books at the library are flying off the shelves, hitting kids in the face and forcing them to take these books home with them. If there are books at the library whose messages you don't agree with, there's a really easy solution to that. Don't check those books out. 
if you're a parent and you don't like some of the messages of those books and you don't want your children reading them, don't have your children check them out. For these books, a parent is required to sign those books out. The books that deal with LGBTQ children. I don't think that anybody else has been interrupted while they've been talking. I've been quiet even when I don't agree with what other people are saying. But I think that children should be able to, uh, and their parents should be able to make those decisions. I would suggest that you not um, have these books be put in a separate section. Um, that might open the city up to um, charges of discrimination since um, uh, uh, people's uh, biological sex, uh, sexual orientation, and gender identity are federally protected categories. Um, these are things that are happening throughout Texas. In fact, there's a county um, that has uh, is being sued by residents because of how it is dealt with um, books uh, such as these and restricting people's access to those books. So I'd encourage you to keep those things in mind. I'm assuming the city does not want to open itself up to uh, a lawsuit, uh, but also keep in mind how this affects lots of different people and them wanting to stay in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Jill uh, Blucher. Thank you for letting me speak. So I've heard a lot about innocent children stumbling upon quote unquote pornographic material at the library. So I wanted to see the situation for myself. I went to look for books from the proposed ban and I randomly picked five from the list which I had to find for myself because I was told at the library by library number one that to get that list, I would need to fill out an information request and have it approved. So once I found it, librarian number two had to point me in the right direction. And by the way, I do frequent the library so I understand where things are shelved and how that works. Um, I wasn't a newbie there. Um, the five books I selected were in five different locations. And as much as I tried to find them on my own, I still needed help from librarian number three. So it is not as easy as it sounds to just stumble upon these books. So let's talk about each one. Stonewall. So it was shelved in the juvenile section with other books about cultural history, some about black history or Hispanic history. And for those who don't know, Stonewall Inn was a place where LGBTQ people gathered, and it was the origin place, the origin place of pride, because it was the beginning of where the riots happened to stop people from being arrested for being themselves, maybe even just wearing clothes that identified them as the other gender. I wear jeans all the time, y'all. I'd be in trouble. Number two, the moon within. So this one was shelved in juvenile fiction. And I kind of saw this as the modern equivalent of Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, a book which, by the way, I got in trouble for having when I was in school. But like most of the girls in my generation, it ushered me through puberty and all the things that come with it and talked about a lot of stuff my mom didn't. The only difference in this one is that the character is transgender. Whether we like it or not, guys, our kids are going to have friends or family members who are gay, lesbian, or transgender. And wouldn't it be nice if they could be kind? I won't go through the others, but I do want to talk about this one. No Way They Were Gay is my favorite. It was fantastic because it is um, bios of people in our history from the Greeks, by the way. We've been here forever who were LGBTQ. And the only thing I can imagine that could be um, offensive in this is the bio of King James. Yes, that one. Ms. Blucher, could you please wrap up your comments? Yes, who was famously queer. So all I would like to say is none of these books jumped off the shelves by themselves. They were all 
in appropriate places and are titled in ways that if you don't want your kid to know about it, don't open that book. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Amy Wiest. service. I don't have anything written fancy, scholarly, or biblically. Um, I was more into trying to find a solution. Um, I called Ben Ziller when, when all this was blowing up, and uh, my biggest concern is our community being divided again. Again. If it's not mass, no mass. Black lives matter, all lives matter. Um, get the shot, don't get the shot. I mean, just you name it. And it's just, it just feels so awful. You know, everyone matters. Okay, but on this topic, on this particular topic, which is why I'm here, because all people matter. And whether we like it or not, GLBTQ, they're here. We're everywhere. I mean, there's people of all sorts of whatever. We're here. And um, though those aren't books that I would read, Ben Zeller did forward them to me, and I was able to read the little, the, you know, the, the four sentences out of a whole book that, yes, it was explicit. I, I'm going to tell you it, it, it was explicit. Uh, but the whole book is not pornographic. One of the books is about drug addiction. Man, we're here. Drug addicts are here. And what happens a lot of times is our guard goes down and we get raped. It doesn't say it exactly like that, though. It goes into an explicit sexual encounter, you know. Uh, so, you know, to take these things away when somebody could read it and identify, that's just, this, you know, this is America. We don't ban books. We figure out a different way, you know, maybe to label it. I'd like to see the system in the library upgraded to where instead of it saying, um, like video games and like movies that we go to, this is rated R. If you're not 16 years old or you're not with your parent, I don't know what the rules are anymore. I don't go to movies. I don't check out X-rated books. I don't, I don't do any of that. But I don't think it shouldn't be available to somebody who needs it for whatever reason. Uh, uh, so, that being said, that's what I'd like to see is the library um, upgraded their system to where the books can be labeled a different, you know, adult or whatever. And when someone goes to check it out, because I've heard two different stories now. I've heard somebody say you have to go get help and you have to do this. But I've also heard, and who knows what to believe. I haven't done it myself, gone and walked the walk but that a child can go and check out a book and read this stuff, and maybe it needs to be labeled, uh, you know, adult, and they can't check it out unless their parent is there. And I say parent, not an adult, but a parent, because the adult they could be with, you want to talk about protecting our kids, the adult they could be with is the one that they know what's in that book, and they want them to read it, and they want them to get vulnerable. So, Miss Weiss, if you'll wrap it up, please. Thank you. Don't ban books. Figure out a way to, to label it, keep things available for those that need it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Lauren Flake. Good afternoon. Mayor Belknight and members of the City Council, thank you for taking the time to address this critical issue of protecting the innocence of the children of Victoria. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. As you're all aware, we've been addressing the availability of obscene books in the public library for over a year. We are not unique. Public libraries and schools across the nation have been fighting parents and concerned citizens rationalizing that removing the availability of the books, materials, and activities with harmful content is wrong. I read an article earlier that says that our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear them or hate them. The second is that to love someone means you must agree with everything they believe or do. Both of these ideas are nonsense. 
You don't have to compromise your con convictions to be compassionate. Disapproval is not hate. Disapproval of what is wrong and harmful is part of godly love. Billy Graham once said, if we fail to solve this moral and spiritual crisis, we may be doomed like the great nations of the past. As I have pointed out previously, the SIPA Internet Safety Policy of the Victoria Public Library states that it is to prevent access to or transmission of inappropriate material, prevent unauthorized access or other unlawful online activity, prevent unauthorized disclosure of personal information, and to comply with the Children's Internet Protection Act. Texas law forbids such things as leaving guns, alcohol, or drugs available to children, not using child safety seats or seat belts in a moving vehicle. It would be child endangerment for a parent to take their child into a bar, a sexually oriented business, or anywhere that a child is placed in a situation that might endanger their life, health, welfare, morals, or emotional well-being. How sad that the Victoria Public Library could need a child warning label on it. It is time for the library shelves to be as safe as the library's internet, our homes, and our businesses. It is time we take our stand and hold the line. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Anthony Madrid. Anthony Madrid. I hope to break the record for short here. We're okay. Um, Go for it. I've, I have prepared these remarks so that I could keep it short. Um, everyone here, everyone on both sides of the issue uh, operates under the embarrassment of the grab bag nature of the books under review. And I think it really hideously confuses the issue. There is two, I mean, there's more than two issues, but the two big ones is just the question of porn and is every scene that involves sex pornography and who should be allowed access to scenes that include any kind of sexuality. And then there's the question of, is it okay to be gay or really anything other than straight? Or is that a toxic substance that needs to be treated like nuclear waste? Some of the books on the list speak to one of these issues and others to another, but anyhow, I object to the two things being treated as if it's the same issue. And it's clear that for some people, uh, they are the same. Not straight is inherently porn to them. It's an attack on innocence of children and so on and harmful. That is not, in the opinion of many, knowledge. There are many books at stake here where sexual images are not the real issue. The real issue is whether we regard it as harmful and unsafe and toxic, et cetera, to uh, allow non-straight children access to the equivalent of, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Scott Bauer. Thank you again, uh, City Council and Mr. Mayor, for your time and leadership and heart for our community and its people. Uh, I truly believe that if you didn't care about Victoria, neither none of y'all would be in those seats. And uh, that's why this library book issue is a big deal. You are the gatekeepers of our city and its people. So I earnestly say thank you for that. But once again, since we met here two weeks ago, the media here in Victoria has done its part with editorial and articles misleading and misdirecting the public on this issue. Anti-gay, censorship, violating First Amendment rights, book banning, book burning, comparing to Nazi Germany. I mean, really? Seriously? I just don't get it. What we have proven to you is right now on the shelves of our library right across the street, we have sexually explicit material that according to our own Texas law is deemed obscene and it does not belong where kids and preteens can have unrestricted access into story. This material, at the very minimum, 
like it's been spoken before earlier, needs to be in a separate section or, or have labels on it or whatever, where a child cannot have access to them willingly without parental permission. And then furthermore, we need to have discussions on who has approved this material and how would you allow this material in our, our library in the first place. I hope we can have these discussions on what's good for Victoria. When removed, I want everyone to know that all of these books are still readily available for anyone that wants them through our interlibrary loan program and can be bought by any parent at any time. So if you want your six-year-old to learn and be exposed to transgenderism, there's a way to do that. If you want your 12-year-old to learn in these books how to have anal sex and give blow, good blowjobs, which we were exposed to two weeks ago, you can do that. If that's the parent you want to be and that's the material that you want your ch child to be exposed to, then go for it. The truth is we as a culture are in a state of sexualized anarchy, doing whatever we want and justifying that there's no consequences for those decisions. And I think you can look around pretty easily and see otherwise. The more we move outside the institution of family and where sex belongs inside the marriage, the more you see our society fall apart all around us. Well, in this library book issue, I for one will stand for protecting the children and the innocence of a child as long as I can. And I know that you all agree, and I can guarantee you that none of you will lose your seat and should feel no political heat from supporting an issue which is a very simple one. I do hope that this local movement will lead to more discussion about these issues and what they do to our culture here in Victoria. I love people, I really do, all shapes, sizes, creeds. I have friends all in the spectrum that we've discussed today, and I want us to see Victoria be a community where virtue is restored, hurting hearts are healed, and grace is proclaimed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Cindy Herndon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council and everybody else. I, did, I wanted to attack this from a spiritual aspect and just kind of what I see, but like the tale of two cities, I see that the stage is being, being set for the best of times and the worst of times. The best of times because we are closer to the second coming of Jesus and the worst of times because it will be the most horrific time period on earth. The book of Revelation is a tale of two cities. Breaking down the Greek, I see Revelation speaks of digital currency. You can think of the central banking digital currency and the, and the executive order recently issued. You can think of, you can see social media in Revelation because it talks about the buying and selling of psyches. And of course, it's a Greek word. It uses the word soul. But um, so you can think of Facebook, Google, and pharmaceuticals that will be used to deceive the nations. And um, it's, you can think of vaccines, new illnesses, hormone blockers, et cetera, come to mind. The UN and the World Economic Forum plan to usher in the new order of the ages, and you can see it on your $1 bill. In November of 2020, John Kerry and Klaus Schwab were speaking about the Great Reset and said it will come now with great swiftness. A few goals are depopulation, the elimination of personal property, and replace Christian values with secular humanism and paganism. Grooming our children through media, such as what we're finding in our schools and libraries today, is being used to accomplish some of these goals. The ancients used temple prostitutes to worship their deities, and Jack Parsons, which was a rocket scientist before NASA, used sex magic to invoke supernatural deities. I've seen both the divine and the demonic in my lifetime. If you find this hard to believe, you can listen to the testimonies of Ted Bundy just prior to his execution and Margie Mayfield's encounter with Stephen Morin, and they both describe a force causing them to commit acts that they didn't want to do. The amazing thing about Stephen Morin, that once he accepted Jesus as his Lord, all the hate and resentment left him. The point of mentioning these two testimonies is, is that we are more than just physical beings, and sex is more than describing something like pleasurable dining. The ancients, as well as Satanists, such as Jack Parsons and Aleister Crowley, understood how to invoke demons. And Jesus said that before his return, and because iniquity will be increased, that the love of many will wax cold. But if you broke down the Greek again, it says the love of many would be psycho. 
So the principles, I believe that, and I've seen, you know, I've witnessed, you know, that the principles of the Bible have been given for our protection. Even though this is a global agenda, I'm asking that you protect the innocence of the children in this city. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Herndon. <laughs> Alfred Reinhardt. Um, first, I want to say that the, that the comments on both sides of the issue about the library have been very interesting to me tonight. Um, I have a very brief comment that um, since the, particularly since the Victoria Advocate thinks that, that books should stay there and everything is fine, uh, as I talk to, to people about, you know, when the subject comes up, um, they say, yeah, that, yeah, I don't know, the, these books. Well, why don't we just simply publish the information that's in question in the Victoria Advocate, and then everybody in the city can read and see the pictures that are in these books, and then maybe we'll get some more. Thank you. Ms. Gabe Hotek. Greetings, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Um, my name is Gay Patek and I live in Victoria. I wanted to bring to you a petition today totaling over 800 signatures ur urging our city representatives to protect the innocence of children through content and age appropriate books, materials and activities purchased with our taxpayer dollars, grant funded money and are donated to the Victoria Public Library. I am asking for a children's collection policy be written that puts boundaries on what can be brought into the 17 and younger sections, whether books, materials, or activities. And to be clear, I am not asking for book burnings, bannings, or censoring. We, we are not dealing with pornography according to the Texas Penal Code. We are dealing with obscene material. Obscene material depicts and or describes sexual activity whether heterosexual or homosexual, that appeals to the unhealthy, indecent, abnormal, degrading, shameful, or morbid interest in nudity, sex, or excretion to minors. I believe these books would have no problem passing the Miller test. This is also about gender identity, or in other terms, a transgender ideology. These books in the children's section of our library do not merely mention that transgender people exist. Rather, they are influencing children to think they themselves might be transgender. True gender dysphoria is incredibly rare and does not need to be suggested in order for it to appear. Libraries are supposed to be safe places for children to explore and to foster a love for reading. We want our taxpayer dollars to build character and strong citizens with age and content appropriate books. This is about protecting the innocence of children. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Carl Westbrook. The topic of human sexuality is incredibly complex. I'm not here to talk about the complexities. I'm here to say that as long as we are in an argumentative and adversarial relationship, not much is gonna be able to be done. It does seem to me that there can be a compromise, and a compromise is not a four-letter word. In a compromise, you have a win-win situation. Otherwise, it's a win-lose situation. City council and county commissioners have a responsibility to, to minister to all people in the community. And we understand that and we respect that. It's an incredibly difficult job. And somehow you all have to wrap your minds around that, dealing with the issues of the library. We must not, we cannot uh, uh, advocate the banning of books. That is the, one of the first steps on the slippery slope to totalitarian governance, whether it be on a local level, a national level, or an international level. 
But I think we can exercise some wisdom in knowing what to do with the materials before us. And it seems to me a very simple solution. As long as we are arguing, we can't talk about the situation. We can't talk about conclusions that we would like to see. We can't, we can't have civil and decent conversation with each other until the argument and the adversaries end. And so I want to recommend that the compromise be what has already been spoken, not just this evening, but often in the past, that there be a division somewhere where the books in question are not made available readily to those age groups that we're trying to protect. Yes, parents have the responsibility and the privilege of rearing their children in the ways they deem appropriate. Our community does not raise, rear our children. We do that as parents, but we, we require and need the support of the community around us. We have the opportunity, it seems like to me, to either prove together we're better or to realize that that's just a dead cliche or a meaningless meme. I think compromise is a good word. It will enable us to sit down and talk perhaps more reasonably with each other. There's been some wonderful statements on both sides of this issue tonight. I encourage you, strongly encourage you, to listen deeply. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Teresa Cordova. Mayor, Council. Thank you for the opportunity to let me speak my mind. Can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ma okay. So I'm here to voice my concern about these efforts being made by others to remove young adult books and other books they find offensive from our library and school shelves. I've heard their concerns and empathize with them. However, as a grandparent myself, and an advocate of the right of children to read, I believe removing these books solely based on these objections would be a terrible disservice to the students. I have read most of these books and I've come to believe they are just too valuable for those students who for whatever reason are questioning a subject or just curious. I strongly urge your decision makers to keep these books on our Victoria Library shelves and to uphold the freedom to read for all students of the community. The Supreme Court has ruled that the right of all children to read books free of viewpoint discrimination is guaranteed by the First Amendment. Not everyone in our community shares the views of those opposed who oppose these books, but the challengers have no right to impose their views on others or demand that educational programs reflect their personal preference. If parents do not want their children to read a particular book, then they are free to request an alternative, but they may not infringe upon the rights of others to read these books or tell other parents what their children may read. Furthermore, restricting access to these books will only crush free expression in our community. It will discourage librarians and teachers from introducing new ideas and expanding children's minds. It will dissuade children from asking questions for fear of addressing offensive or inappropriate topics. It will teach them that fear and ignorance supersede the quest for knowledge. Reading is the safest way for kids to learn about the world in which they are growing up. And doing so in a home, library, or school setting with guided discussions will only help them anticipate and appreciate real life problems. I therefore urge you to ensure that Victoria Library policies are followed and that these books remain available to students and children in this library and in their school libraries. Many of these books that are being disputed, not all of them even from this library, have been on the shelves since 2015 why are they just now being disputed? I am a taxpaying citizen. I've known about these books and other banned books. Thanks to reading them, I better understand 
how it would feel to walk in the shoes of others. Ms. Cordova, can you please wrap it up? And compassion and empathy instead of fear and disgust. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Prima Ranjan. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Prima Ranjan. I appreciate you listening to our request today, hoping that my words fall on good ground. I'm sick of the perversity, the corruption, and the malady of lies that are besieging our children with no defense in sight. Allowing children access to perverse books can open the door to Pandora's box and probably lead to addictions of pornography and visions of sexual perversions that may haunt them the rest of their lives. Testimonies from people who've come out of pornography have revealed they have either been exposed to lewd pictures and perverse books at a young age or tragically been the victim of rape or incest. So I appeal to you, elected officials, Please do what you can to set up canons of morality and decency in this community. Since time is of the essence, I'm going to read an article that I wrote to the Victoria Advocate reiterating my views on this subject. Can we stop being selfish as a society and start thinking about the welfare of children? I am an immigrant from India, and I was excited to come to America, a country that promised freedom, prosperity, and an excellent life. But to my dismay, I see the godly freedom of America that was established on to pursue our dreams and to stand for what is upright is being stripped away. I stand with parents concerning these books of perverse, lewd, and sexually inappropriate nature that are in the children's section of the public library. Something has to be done about them. I don't believe I'm overreacting. Pornography and sexual perversion seem to have seeped into places of learning, our entertainment, and even our media. I'm not a bigot or, bigot or a racist or a hatred of LBGT people. God created us all. He loves us all, and he wants what's best for all. But when we stand for goodness and morality in this society, our voices are silenced by the loud voices of those who disagree with our views. Is freedom of speech only for those who support liberal views and not for those who stand for God's laws of righteousness? Can we stop being selfish as a society and start thinking about the welfare of children? Parents need to discern the times and supervise what is being taught to their children. Our schools and libraries should be places of godly learning and upright thinking. Our children in America need to be reinforced in their math, reading, and writing skills. Geography and the history of nations should be correctly taught. The very hint of any kind of sexual immorality should be removed from children's books and school curriculum. The power of suggestion and gender identification should not be taught in schools, creating confusion and wrong thinking in children. Mr. John. Sorry. Just wrap it up real quick. Thank okay. You. So let's just stand for freedom, freedom for a better America that we can be proud of. Thank you. All right, Mr. David Brown. Mr. Mayor, City Council, Mr. City Manager, thank you for your opportunity to express my interest once again. I appreciate your favorable consideration of the Building Standards Committee. I'm also interested in the Planning Committee, and if that's a possibility, I'd be happy to serve and look forward to doing so. But not interested in the library library committee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I I just can't help comment that there are some awfully good impressions, feelings, and opinions that have been expressed here today. And I have to say that leaving here, I'm not leaving with the firm thought I had in my mind about this issue. It's good to have the discussion, and I think that we'll all benefit by it. Thank you. Uh, Eliana York. I get that right? Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, very pretty name. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Hi, um, Mayor Bachnight, council members. My name is Eliana York. Thank you for letting me speak today. 
I'm a native Victorian. I was born and raised in this community. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, Catholic, nurse, but most importantly, my contribution to this community is as a pediatric nurse practitioner taking care of Victoria's children. I'm here today in support of the Victoria Public Library to allow books that help increase the knowledge of children with regard to their anatomy, sexual development, puberty, and gender identity. It's detrimental as a community that we provide a non-judgmental, supportive atmosphere for children who may need gender-affirming resources. This helps reduce the risk of high rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide within this population. In 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out and voiced their strong support for gender affirmation in the LGBTQ communities. And I quote, as pediatricians, we will continue to speak as an advocate for our patients. We want transgendered and gender diverse youth to know that not only do we care for them, we value them, and we want to ensure they have access to what they need and deserve. So my question to you, Mayor and Council Members, why as a community do we not have the same attitude towards LGBTQ members of this community? What does that say about our love for all children, all families, no matter what they look like? I attended the City Council meeting two weeks ago. I heard the discussion from both sides of this issue. There was outrage that some of the words in these books included penis and vulva. It's just downright silly to me that members of our community feel like this is too inappropriate for children to know. My three-year-old daughter knows that she has a vagina. My six-year-old son calls his penis a penis. I stress not only to my children, but my patients, to call their anatomy what it is. Many of you wonder how can this possibly um, empower a child? It's a proven fact that when a child knows the anatomical name for his or her body parts, it deters sexual predators from inappropriate touching or sexual activities and empowers the child because if there's ever an outcry, it's more credible. It is not the job of the city of Victoria or the county to make decisions for a parent on what their child can read. Despite the intentions of the concerned members of this community, it will further marginalize LGBTQ youth and it is an imposition of the values of a small minority of the Victoria community. Um, let us be a community where everyone has a place to be their authentic true selves and embrace the notion that knowledge available in books is a win for all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. York. <laughs> Mr. Keith Williams. Good afternoon, Mayor Bug Knight. City Council members, first of all, thank you for all you do for the city. You do have a tough job, and mainly when, I, when you start talking about finances. <laughs> you, I take my hat off to you. <laughs> well, I had a statement prepared for this, but, you know, just listening to all this, I mean, somewhere along the line, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of went in a whirlwind to me, uh, and, and, and a lot I don't understand. I don't understand why you know, we should even be here discussing this. I mean, if we mirrored the laws of the land, if we mirrored the laws of what goes in Victoria County and every other county about what's appropriate for young and old, 17 and under, you know, you can't go get married at age 15 without a parental consent. Uh, we can't put girly magazines in the library without it having to have a disclosed section, but somehow these books have uh, infiltrated our library and like one uh, other speaker said, our schools. You know, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I have nothing against the LGBTQ uh, community. Uh, it was a gay man walking my wife down from my wedding, you know. Uh, so I don't have anything against that. What I do have, what I am against, and I, I stand strong for, I'm a Bible-believing man, and I stand strong for protecting our kids. And this, these, these, this material, I only saw one book. I mean, it blew my mind. And the picture that was there was unsettling. 
And it just, I mean, it's hard to fathom. Like I say, I can't understand why anybody, whether you're gay, lesbian, straight, or dog, cat, whatever, how anybody can't understand that this is wrong for the inappropriate age of, the, of certain kid children. Regardless of what anyone says, it's just the truth. That's what we got logs for. We, you can't do things until you're 18. You can't drink until you're 21 or, you know, it's, it's things like that. So why can't we protect our kids? Now, I don't believe in this stuff about bullying anybody because they're gay, because that's wrong. It's wrong in the eyes of the Lord. It's wrong, period. But this here, my prayer and ho my hope and prayer is that you will take and come up with some kind of solution. If it means putting these books in another section, it's that simple. But to, let, to have that available for six and seven-year-olds, it's going to tear somebody down. I don't care what you say because I've been there. I don't know if you guys remember. Some of you may not be as old as I am. But we had National Geographic magazines in the fifth grade. We couldn't wait to get in the library to get a look at them. <laughs> you know, I'm just being truthful with you. So take that into consideration. It wasn't appropriate then. It's not appropriate now. And by golly, if people are over 18, let them go. They, they can do what they want. But we have to protect our young lives because if we don't, nobody will. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. We got two more, Ms. Wanda Ori. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and greetings to you, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Wanda Ori, and I live in Victoria. I want to begin by quoting from a recent article in the Christian Post. We've arrived at a place of moral insanity where our culture is unraveling because we've abandoned God's absolute truth. In Romans um, 1, 18 through 31, it talks about a downward spiral of people who suppress the truth. They become futile in their imaginations and their foolish hearts were darkened. And God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not proper. And, and I see that this describes the current indoctrination of our children to ways that are not proper for children. And the issue of my concern, again, is the age and content inappropriate books that are available in the public library that are located in the juvenile picture se section. The, uh, the, that's ages four to eight and the juvenile section, and the young adult section, ages 12 and up. And again, I want to emphasize this issue is about protecting the innocence of our children with our taxpayer dollars. There are books available regarding the concept of the transgenderism, starting with ages under five through picture books. Again, this ideology is harmful to children that age. And again, for the sake of time, I've given you some references. I'll give you the, 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 my letter. Um, again, there's books um, for, available to the children that are, contain uh, sexually explicit content. The word obscenity is uh, appropriate. It's pornographic in nature, but it does not, um, it falls short of the actual definition of pornography. Again, I emphasize this is an issue about protecting the innocence of our children with our taxpayer dollars. I believe we need accountability with our taxpayer dollars. We need to ensure we have boundaries. Again, that was just spoken about. Boundaries that protect our children. We have those boundaries with the purchase of alcoholic beverages and so forth. Flashing lights around for their, for their physical safety in school zones. Why not boundaries for their innocence in purchasing content and age appropriate, appropriate books, materials, and activities with our taxpayer dollars at the Victoria Public Library. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Obrey. Aliska Smiga. Hello, Mayor, Council. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Aliska Smiga. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a Christian, a lifelong resident of this area, 
a taxpayer, a homeowner, and I am a transgender woman. I also identify as bisexual, but I'm only going to speak on my experience as a trans person. I grew up in a loving family, but I didn't come out until I was 39. The reason, well, a big reason, no representation. I had no one on TV or in movies to look up to, no positive representation of a trans person that I could see. Uh, people like me uh, were always the butt of jokes and comedies. My kind were always the villains in dramas. I knew I was different from the age of four. My earliest memories are those of feeling that my mind didn't match my body. But being a kid in the 80s, during the height of the AIDS crisis, I learned quickly to hide who I was. I love that I'm transgender. Some days are hard, some days are easier. But I did not choose this. I know I'm not going to change any minds here about how anyone feels about queer people. I just want to say that there are kids in the city who are gay, who are trans, and who are non-binary. What about those kids? Aren't they worthy of seeing themselves in the books they read? If there is one queer kid, just one, it is important that that child be able to have the books available to them that represents who they are. That helps the child understand the world through their perspectives that are familiar to them and books that teach the child that it is okay to be who they are. No child or adolescent deserves to feel scorned, hated, or othered, or treated any differently just because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. I feel the scorn, hate, and looks in the stairs every day when I'm out in public. I feel it now. Because of my gender identity and how I choose to present myself, a lot of you will immediately discount what I have to say. You'll silently scoff, perhaps roll your eyes. But it doesn't matter. This isn't about me. This is about the queer children and teens of the area who must live their lives, whether they choose to be in or out of the closet, in a community with a small vocal minority of people who are trying their hardest to erase any positive representation of LGBT books in the books available to them. A few meetings back, a gentleman showed some pictures in an educational book for young adults. It, de it depicted a cartoon drawing of a transgender woman's body. He labor labeled it as vulgar and obscene, but what I saw was beautiful. For the first time, I saw a body like mine depicted in an educational book. If I had been able to see myself represented, I wouldn't have been ashamed of who I was for so long. It's hard to look at any other way at this any other way than censorship, erasure of po positive LGBT representation. They say it's to protect the children, but I was once a child in this town, and I had nothing to look at that represented me. No depictions of what I was, what I felt. Now kids have the chance to see themselves in these books. Feelings seen means everything to someone that feels unwarranted, marginalized. The youth of Victoria don't deserve to be reduced and erased. So members of the city council, I humbly ask you to end this madness, the censorship, and just leave the books alone. Um, Thank you. Can you please wrap it up? I'm done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you to everybody who came and spoke before us tonight. Um, we're going to close citizens' communication at this time and go back and do items from council. I'll ask everybody if they have any item that they wish to discuss before we jump into the one listed. No problem. Mayor, I'd like to give a big thank you to the Victoria Police Department as a father who takes their new freshman to high school, um, the officers at Victoria West have done a fine job of keeping everything moving. I was afraid of the nightmare of traffic, as I've been told for years. However, it, I've been pleasantly <laughs> surprised and appreciate the efforts. Uh, hopefully there's a learned pattern and they can go about doing their daily jobs uh, as, as we do when school's not in session, but kudos to them. All right, so I want to thank each of you up here before we start this discussion. Um, specifically, I want to thank you for your thoughtfulness, your openness and willingness to tackle this difficult issue. We don't all have to agree with each other's opinions, but let's maintain the decorum and the respect that I know we have for each other and we have enjoyed over the years with each other. Um, I plan to keep this discussion open for about 30 to 45 minutes. We could go on for this for hours, but we're going to take this in a thoughtful, methodical steps as we go through some future council meetings as well. Um, at the end of this, I would like us to have maybe some coalescence, if we can, 
of thoughts on what direction we want to go. Staff definitely needs our direction. That's our job to, to give them policy direction, right? Um, and last time that we met, I outlined uh, a couple of ideas that I had, and I just wanted to go through them again to refresh your memory, and I think we can add upon them, and then we can come back and discuss the merits of each. You all okay with that? Yes, sir. Okay. Sure. So <clears throat> the options that I went through are update the library policy to direct what to do with sexually explicit and human sexuality books for um, all age groups. Uh, remove and appoint new members to the library advisory board that meet the city council's ideals for the library. Develop and pass an ordinance that pertains to the aforementioned books. Appoint new members as terms expire. Do nothing, leave everything as is. Um, and work towards a solution that is a compromise, keeps intact First Amendment rights, protects our children's <coughs> minds at the same time. For example, is a new section warranted? Or do they need to go into a parenting? section so that there's that oversight. Um, so with that, very quick and brief on that, is there anything else anybody would like to add as lists of options or if the consensus is that there's not an issue and we don't need to keep going, it's a short discussion maybe, but I for one think there is an issue with some of these books and I think they meet the Miller test and we should proceed forward with trying to address those books that passed the Miller test? Um, I, I respectfully disagree. I, I believe the library board was... Um, Can you speak a little better into the mic, I please? believe the library board was uh, shown the Miller test. I was at a library board meeting where they were shown the, the Miller test, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm for keeping things the way they are. Um, I appreciate all the people, and I understand there's a lot of people who are very fearful for their kids, and and I understand there are a lot of people on both sides of this issue who are fearful for LBGTQ kids and for kids understanding sex. Um, I'm not for banning books, and I um, I think uh, the I think we, what we need to talk about is what the library is supposed to be about. The library is supposed to have different ideas not just conform to somebody's specific confirmational bias. And so these ideas will, ob obviously they won't necessarily be ideas that you agree with. Now, there's two issues here. We keep bringing up the children. We're trying to protect the children. I think it's up to the parents to protect their children. A lot of these books have been in the library since 2015. All of a sudden, the list showed up and then now it's gone Texas-wide about books that need to be banned. I had to laugh when the man brought up about the National Geographic. Yes, I knew where the National Geographic books were, and it didn't cause me to turn out to be a pervert or whatever. Uh, the, LG, the LGTQ books, if you want to ban those, to me that's discrimination. Now, sexuality, I agree with what a lady said, it's a penis, it's a vulva, it's a vagina. It's not that big of a deal. Lots of times people don't want to talk to their kids about these particular subjects. If you don't like the books that are in the library, don't let your kids read them. But if you're going to pull these books out of the library, you're keeping other people the, the opportunity to see these books. So it isn't just pulling books, it's Everybody should have the opportunity to see these books. Now, I do understand about maybe we need another classification for books. And I'd be willing to discuss that. But as, let me tell you this, okay, they can't, say you pull a children's book off because you don't like it. They can go, the children can run over to the adult section or the young adult section and find it. You, are we gonna put up walls? in the library to keep the children from only going to a certain place. I think it's a parent's responsibility to see what their children are reading. If they want to give their child a library card, it's up to them. That's my thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Lofgren. Um, I, I'll get in. I have a couple of thoughts, but I, I do have some questions along the way that maybe we can have answered as well. 
uh, as I go through there. I'm a, I'm a parent of a 14, 12, and 11-year-old, so I, I certainly understand from a, a children's section, uh, it, it affects me uh, greatly. Um, question, what are the defined sections that we have in the library for our youth? Is there a particular age group we have Children's, yeah, we have so young my understanding, adults. and Dana can obviously correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the children's section is 12 and under, and then there's the preteen section that is technically in the adult section, but is preteen um, for 18 and younger. Correct? We don't define it that way. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, someone made a comment. They called it juvenile picture was 4 to 8. Yeah, it's juvenile was yeah. 8 to 12, and then I guess young adult was 12 it's, to 17. Young, young we don't yeah. put age numbers on sections sure. because we really want to encourage parents to help their children decide what reading levels they're at. Um, so as far as just having like these set ages and that's it, we don't. Young Adult is a transitional collection that kind of bridges from, I guess, your juvenile fiction possibly to your adult, or you skip that, you can go right to adult. I mean, sure. there's just a lot of choices that the parent and the child need to make based on those reading levels. Some people, there are a lot of adults that read young adult, and that young adult could mean 21. We call, you know, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, young adults as well. Sure. So as far as having like it defined in policy, we don't have that. Okay. So my question in that regard, because we have a young adult section, and because someone's a strong reader, uh, and, and, and doesn't necessarily in, in imply con content when they're young and can read above their, their reading level. Um, I, I simply ask the question to myself, if we have a young adult section, what is a young adult is defined as? And so we've got a 12 to 18 kind of benchmark here at our library, but I simply went in and, and did a little search myself and through the National Institute of Health, through MIT, EDU, they classify psychologically a, a young adult from 18 to 26. As a parent, I do look at my children and go, I wouldn't call them young adults. They may, cl they may reach that age from a library standpoint. They're preteens. They're, they're young. I, I couldn't, as an adult, classify them as a young adult. And, and it, certainly doing a little research, the government, the National Institute of Health, doesn't classify them that as either. And so do we have enough classifications for the books? And, and from there would be one of my things. Do we have a preteen section? Do we have a true young adult se section? Because a young adult, to me, is more like a college stage kid. Uh, young adult and from that section. So that's that's one point that I would I would bring up. The other question that I really had in regards to this was the rating systems that are used. Who does the rating systems for the books that are that are come into the library? We don't use rating systems. We're Who? not oh, okay. we use reviews um, of materials to choose items and we also look at the uh, subject headings. Sure. Um, to make sure that we're covering the subjects that are of interest sure. or to provide a wide variety of, of opinions and viewpoints on different subjects. Do, do publishers kind of do their ratings is, is what I'm kind of reviews, getting at? Reviews come from the trade journals. So our professional journals. Um, publishers Weekly is one that comes out of the publishing world. Um, the... Review, some of the review journals are teachers who write those reviews, and some are librarians, academic, and public. So it's a, it's a variety. Um, so, and then we also will look at things that are written. You know, there are book reviews that happen, come out in just your regular, used to be like book review sections in magazines and journals that we commonly read. But majority of what we look at are written by teachers, librarians, publishing world as well. Yeah, publishing world. So and my question to that was from a movie standpoint, um, I know producers and directors used to give rating systems way back when, and they went, well, maybe we don't need to have people on the inside doing those ratings. And the, so they found an independent kind of parent 
rating system is what they've come up with to give appropriate ratings from that. I just want to make sure that we're not doing kind of the inside people doing that. I wouldn't want Harvey Weinstein uh, rating my movies or, or even a head coach of a, of a game calling balls and strikes for their own team. And so I just want to make sure that we have an independent group that is somehow rating these books uh, appropriately. That's all I ask for objectivity. No, I think that's a good idea. I've done a little bit of looking. I know Miss Lacey has too, trying to find something like that, and it's a it's a difficult search. I don't know if if uh, we can get some help from library staff to understand better what's out there and what's available. But, but let me clarify: I don't have a problem with content of books th that are in the library. Just a, a appropriately placed. Um, it would be my right. I had a, I had a question. I, for um, staff as well, when we see on these book ratings, um, reading level, and it says 5.9, I'm guessing that's somewhere between fifth and sixth grade reading level. Is that correct? They call it like Lexile. Uh, and so reading teachers RL. follow these Lexile levels. And so if it's like a 5.9, that probably comes out of the AR system that the schools um, Accelerated Reader uh, Program out of VISD. And so that's to help parents identify, like if you're, you've taken a test in VISD and you're given that reading level of you are a 5.9, you're reading at that level, then the parent will have something to gauge where they want to go up, you know, push their child up from that or look for those that just have that Lexile level. And is that reading level uh, dependent on the language or the content? It would be the words. So it's not really I think, I'm, I'm discussing sure. the content and the appropriateness of the content for that age group, but they're saying the way that the small words are for the fifth grader or their bigger words maybe strung together for the seventh grader, that on that reading level, but That's not correct. content rating at yeah. all. So, you know, I looked through some of these and one that comes to mind is the A Court of Mist and Fury. Thank you. A Court of Mist and Fury, which has a reading level of 5.9, happens to be my eldest daughter's favorite book. Um, she told me that before and uh, was surprised that we were considering doing something with it uh, through this process. But then she started thinking about it. She goes, well, if they're having it in the section that's, you know, early teen, this or that, she goes, mom wouldn't let me read that until I was 16 or 17 when my mind got more developed. And, I, and now I know why, but I would never give that to a 12-year-old. And that's, that's my 20-year-old daughter telling me this stuff. So she understands at this age now why it was inappropriate. She didn't understand when she was 12 and couldn't read it why it was inappropriate. But just a side note, sorry. Um, well, Ms. Scott? I have, um, I don't know, just some more thoughts to overlay. Uh, and that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I do think that I would like to see some changes in the policy going forward. Um, I think that these topics, um, human sexuality is so much more openly discussed now. It's the popular trend. There are several other popular trends. So if I'm going to write a book that I want to sell, that's what I'm going to write it on. And so there's going to be more and more and more of these books available because it's the popular thing to write right now. And so that's my thought process on why I feel like we should look a little bit at the policy going forward of how many books that we, that we bring in dealing with, I'm going to call them alter, alternate lifestyles. And I don't think there's anybody that doesn't know what alternate lifestyle means. I think that includes children. And I also think that the facts of human reproduction have not changed. They have not changed since caveman. So I don't know that we need new books that show us human reproduction more explicitly and more graphically than the books that we bought before just because they're new. And we've already gotten used to these books that are fairly graphic, so let's get some more. So, so um, I, I've, 
overlaying all of that, I do agree also. I think a good compromise is um, to place books and I'll again say with alternate lifestyles uh, in a different section or graphic books. I was really taken in this whole conversation to learn. My frame of reference of a library has always been the Dewey Decimal System. And in the Dewey Decimal System, I think the majority of the books we're talking about would already be in a section on a series of shelves because they would all be grouped together. And so I was really stunned that that's not the way perhaps our public library, perhaps other public libraries, but that's not the way that our books are presented. And to me, that is a source of, of where some of the objection, some of the problem is coming from. So I'm definitely um, in favor. I'm, uh, Reverend Westbrook mentioned it as a compromise. I think a number of us have thought about it. Um, I'd like to see a section. I want that section to be open, You know, certainly not shoved back in a corner where it's dark, uh, not, not crammed against a wall. It should be open for both the, the uh, protection of anybody that wants to be there and for the protection of anybody that wants to be there. Uh, so that it's, anyway, that, uh, that doesn't really address your particular topics, but maybe it does. No, these were just spitballing at the whiteboard sure. and putting stuff up there of options. Um, I've, to, um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking along your lines, but I want to hear from everybody else. Um, if y'all want to speak to the item, of course. But, sure. <clears throat> so, you know, my my approach to this, I mean, step back, look at it from what are we hearing from our community, okay? You know, this has been couched in conversations I've had with folks uh, in certain media coverages as book banning, and I don't, I don't think it is book banning. I don't think that's really what we're talking about. I'm opposed to banning books uh, on a personal level. I don't think that's right. Um, members of the community have approached me and said, hey, you know, don't be banned in books. And I understand that sentiment. I mean, just the vocabulary, the words we use matter. <laughs> Book burning has a negative connotation going back through national, international history. I think the issue really, from my, my perspective, is much broader than banning books. I think, I think there's, there's millions of books that aren't in our library. Millions of books. But they're not banned. They just don't fit within our collection policy. Or they're not something that our library thinks, OK, this meets this factor, this factor, this factor. So because a book's not, not in the library doesn't mean it's banned. The question really, to me, becomes the collection policy. OK? Um, and I think this, uh, Mayor Bautnack, goes with your uh, kind of bullet point one there on updated library policy. I would like to see us encourage the library uh, advisory board to revisit that policy. I know we've that's been mentioned before, it's been discussed before. Um, and to me, the question that should be asked is not necessarily what books don't we want, it's what books do we want? How do we identify the books that should be within that policy? Um, I've, I've gone through and looked at various collection policies of libraries around the state, around the nation, they all seem to be pretty cookie cutter, cut and paste. And they, where they came from the American Library Association, Texas Library, whatever they are, they, they, they all look very similar and they all seem to have the same criteria. Our library's policy included in that. What I've noticed is there's passing mentions in those policies about community standards, but they are passing mentions. But if you look at uh, statutes, if you look at legal uh, opinions that deal with these types of issues, they talk very heavily and look very heavily at community standards. I would like to see our library policy incorporate community standards more than it does. But in order to do that, we're gonna have to identify community standards. And that's gonna be a difficult thing. I have personal opinions. Each one of us have personal opinions, but we're all a community. And we all may have different standards, but we need to keep that in mind that this is our community, our library, our policy. 
we shouldn't have to just fall in line with what everybody else is doing because, oh, this is an easy cookie cutter, cut and paste policy. Let's craft a policy that matches our community. It makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, that seems, that's what I would like to see. I, I, you know, there are certain, certain books that have been brought to our attention that my personal opinion is that they are inappropriate for the age groups that the publishers say, these are for eight to 10 year old kids. And not necessarily just because of content, but because of graphic depictions, uh, because of graphic pictures, um, but also because of content. It's my personal opinion that eight-year-olds don't need to learn about masturbation by looking at an illustration of a kid sitting in a, on a picnic table in a park masturbating. That, 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 that offends my community standard that I have. <laughs> now, is there a community standard that others have? I'm sure there is. But we need to identify what those community standards are so that we can put together a collection policy that truly reflects our community. Um, and so, I, you know, I think, I think the ideas of ratings, um, I, I think the library, while it has a responsibility to all users, those users inc include parents and include children, let's help parents figure out if there are certain books that have certain content that may be objectionable, whatever that content is, let's help them figure out, okay, here's where those books are. You know, should we look at, a, at an organization system? Should we look at a rating system? Should we look at some kind of review system that's available if you don't, if you want it, and if you don't want it, you don't have to look at it. Those are sort of things that I think we need to give the, the library advisory board the ability to take those issues, take, take our suggestions, comments, and put together a policy that, that reflects what we want as a council. And I think they need the opportunity to do that because I think that's gonna be a, a defining moment of what that policy looks like is determining what community standards are and looking at what collection policy is best gonna represent us. Um, you know, are there independent rating systems? Um, do we have enough sections? I think those are all good questions that a collection policy can address. And I, you know, I think we, we need to give them time to do that and bring something back to us to take a look at. Let me throw in, uh, you're talking about collection policy, and I think my feeling on that is that right now our collection policy is one size fits all. This is the policy for any book, and I'd like to see a separate collection policy for children's books, possibly a separate collection policy for young adults, uh, than, uh, than just you know trying to make one size fits all, and I don't know if, if any of us have said that out loud, that that's part of what I think is wrong with the policy that we have right now, is it's too broad. Uh, it needs to have subsections for different age groups. That's my feeling. And, you and I meant to say that out loud, and thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I do think we so need separate agree. policies from the children's <clears throat> children side, absolutely. Well, I haven't been here for too many meetings, but I've been watching. And to me, I think that creating a new up, updated library policy is needed. And once, and I think that policy should be a joint effort between the um, library board and ourselves. And once we get to meet with them, we can all look at what we have in common and what we need to compromise on. I think that um, a different section would be good. We need to work with, I mean, I'm, I'm like Jen, the Dewey Decimal System is what we had when we were growing up. We didn't have all this material available readily for the kids. And I disagree, I don't think parents get down with the kids all the time. Um, because, you know, they go and drop them off at the library and expect for the library to babysit the kids. So that's where the problems come in because the kids sometimes are left alone because they need to go to the library, go do their homework. But when they finish their homework and their parents aren't there, then they can walk around and, you know, just, just like kids, they can get in trouble. So I think that we need to have a section where they can you know, the, the adults can definitely sign out material for the kids if they want. 
But if I don't want my child doing that, then I don't need to have it that easily or that readily available for them. You know, I'm not saying to ban the books or take the books out of the library. I'm just saying to move them to where, you know, the kids, but, you know, kids are kids. They're going to be curious, and they're going to want to go and see the books anyway. So um, we're still going to have, it's not going to be a full, you know, uh, foolproof, because the kids are still going to go up there and, and look, because other kids will talk, and that's how, you know, they go and find out these things. Um, I respect all, you know, genders. I understand that that's, you know, something that we have up and coming, and we have to, you know, accept all human beings as children of God. And I do not in no way, no, you know, saying that, you know, these books are going to be banned, but I think that everybody should be taken into account. And um, we just need to work on a solution and a compromise is probably going to be the best or is going to be the best way so that we don't, you know, keep this going for another year or so. I appreciate everybody's comments, and um, it's opened up my eyes to the new library system because I was like, okay, I may not be able to find a book in the library. <laughs> but yeah. Thank yeah. you, Ms. Solis. Uh, <clears throat> very complex um, <laughs> uh, topic. So without going over things uh, that Dwayne said or Jan said, again, to shorten the time here, I agree with with y'all, both y'all, about 95% of, 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 uh, of what y'all said. I need more clarification from Ms. Allison Lacey on what the Texas law is considering obscenities, okay? Uh, two people said it, and I, I want the, the, the law, I want the number, and I want exactly what it says about pornography. Okay, uh, I believe the collection policy uh, for the library uh, needs to be reviewed. Uh, I don't agree with the American uh, with uh, uh, Dana Capano. Uh, I just chopped up your last name. Uh, sorry, Dana, saying that, that uh, uh, we need to follow the American uh, Library Association guidelines or 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 uh, p policies. I think we need to develop our own. Uh, from what she said, she said our, uh, our rating system, uh, it appears she said that our, our rating system is subjective, not objective, because we, we, we don't have a, a good way to, uh, uh, to review books. Uh, uh, Carl uh, uh, Westbrook said it uh, best tonight, that until we quit arguing and come to some kind of agreement, there's not going to ever be a solution at all. That There will not be a solution until we uh, compromise, uh, come to some kind of uh, solution and compromise. I, I don't appreciate anyone attacking the LGBTQ in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, I don't uh, um, um, want anybody from that uh, group attacking me for uh, wanting to protect our children from obs obscene material, not anything concerning LGBTQ. I've got a lot of friends out there, and Anthony, and, and you know that, Tony. I got a lot of friends out there uh, th that uh, we need to we need to come to some kind of compromise. We need to figure this out. You know, if it takes six months or a year, but these groups <clears throat> have to quit fighting, and we we have to quit pointing fingers. <clears throat> And we got to uh, uh, find a solution. Again, uh, I want to want that law as soon as possible so we can determine it, what, what are we trying to figure out here, what are we trying to do, what, what are we not trying to do. But uh, the name calling and, and the finger pointing uh, for these four different groups has to quit. All right. Thanks. Well, just sitting back here listening to everybody, right? I, I think I heard a consensus that we think there's an issue with some of the books in the library. Um, I heard two different type of compromise of putting them in some, some section that are still accessible. 
but then we also have some policy changes that deal with different levels of maturity within our youth and um, and whether or not they even get into those sections but you know if you took some of the comments tonight about how parents should be responsible in this and that and don't take away those parents rights well why don't we take some of these books that are human sexuality and that we don't want to take out of the library why don't we put them in the parenting section if, if this is supposed to be a conversation between a child and his parent about these issues that they're facing, why wouldn't they be in the parenting section? And I think there's, there's instances we could say, let's put it in this section, let's put it in that section, if that's the way we want to go. But I'm just saying those are the two things that I heard, maybe collecting those together so that there was a restricted access and uh, new policies. Uh, as you say that, and, and I, if, if that's the route we would go, I would be very careful to take a, a collective human sexuality slash relationships. It's not LGBTQ, hetero, it's all. I, I mean, I, I say relationships and sexuality isn't, isn't one group versus another. It, that's collective. And so I would hope if that's the, the goal is that it's all encompassed and not separating out one group versus another. I don't from think we simple. could. Yeah, I, I, I just. Yeah, I don't think we could do okay. that. Actually, I like the way the system is now, and I don't have a problem with it. And and I know you're talking about moving sexuality, certain books to a certain section. Um, there was a, there's a book that's called "Sex Is a Funny Word." And I looked up the book, and I was shown the book, and it shows illustrations of female and male genitalia. And when I was first shown the book, I go, well, why is that in the kids' section? And I, I went and I looked at all the books, and all these books are very popular. And none of the books that have been brought up are not, they're all very popular. But one of the, the first review I read about this book was, this lady said uh, her son was abused by a relative, and he discovered this book. And they had talked to counselor after counselor, and this, he wouldn't talk to anybody about anything. And when they, he discovered this book, he showed it to his mom. They started talking about it, and now they talk. So I think there's both sides to all these books. So I, I've seen excerpts from these books, and yes, they shock me too. <laughs> they do. But I, I think you need to understand what the whole books are about, because a lot of these books are about date rape. They're about things that happen to teenagers that teenagers can't even talk to their parents about. And yes, times have changed since when you and I went to the library. Sexuality's out there more. There's a lot more problems with sexuality. But the only place people have, for kids have to go to find out about this oftentimes is the library. So some parents wouldn't even let their kids check out these books. And maybe the kids need to see them on their own because they don't have anybody to talk to. So I think there's two sides to every issue here. Um, I, I understand maybe a different somehow rating books, but you're talking about right now there is no rating system for books, and we're going to come up with one. That's going to be really interesting. Um, I'm, they, I don't think anything in the library now would be classified as obscene. If it was, somebody could take us to court and we'd be happy to pull the books out. And the Miller test was, we all know about the Miller test, and I believe the library board does too. I support their decisions. I'm, you know, I understand people's concerns, but I also have a concern for the parents that want to be able to find these books in the library. If you take a library book and you make it hard for somebody to find. Well, why would it be harder to find? Well, because a kid necessarily wouldn't come across it. You said a parent wants to go find this book and it'd be harder to find. Or a find. kid. A kid. Say a kid goes across. Okay, let's talk about the penguin book, okay, which I find nothing wrong with penguins. It happens to be male penguins that raise the young anyway. But then these books are not accessible to people. If you take a book and you hide it somewhere, now I can understand classifying a book differently, but still it's open to the public. But if you start taking children's books and classifying different them because they have pictures of genitalia or whatever, 
I think that's wrong. That's what we have a library advisory board for. Um, I've heard people say, well, we could take the books out and people could check them out from another library. But that's, you're taking, you're taking the book away from people. You're making it hard. They're not going to discover the books. Books are supposed to be in the library so you can discover them. And it's, it's we, one. There's this, thing about, there's this thing about we want to protect the children. Well, the children go over to the young adult section, then go find the National Geographic book on the body. I mean, where do you draw the line? We have a library board, and we have librarians that have been doing this for years, and all of a sudden, there's an issue. And I understand. I think it's been an a, a issue that's been building over the years. It, and I agree and with it's, you. It's it, not it gotten the attention, not gotten the attention, and not gotten the attention. And I think now, I think there's a, a big contingency that's had enough. And I understand that, and, but I just think it's going to be really hard to draw lines about what goes where and what goes. And then if we draw this line, what if somebody decides that they don't want books on that are non-Christian books? Where do we draw the line? Well, that's a First Amendment right. Well, you I, could, you I'm, could say, un, you I'm could under the opinion that a lot of these books that we've been presented and shown fail the Miller test. Hmm. Um, I see them as sexually explicit for no other reason than sexual explicitness. And if it's being a book to help a child with date rape, it doesn't need to be that graphic. And I think that it, it steps over <coughs> the line on some of these and causes more issues and sexualizes it as opposed to dealing with the problem of date rape. And I see it going, crossing over the line, and that's why I think it, it needs to be addressed by us and by policy. And, you know, I, I like what Dr. Young said about rating systems and the development of the mind. I pointed out reading level 5.9, it's just how the words are strung together. It doesn't deal with what the book content is and what's the appropriateness of that book. And I think if we can find some way to define appropriateness, age appropriateness of the, the books that we have, I think we stand a much better chance of success for any type of changes we want to make. But we got to find that. And it, so far, it's been elusive. Um, not giving up hope because, as I mentioned last time, it's hard to define those books. It means something different to everybody else. Um, and um, the ones that I'm concerned about are the just really sexually explicit books that I think cross the line. Mayor, if... Yes, sir. Are you all okay if we provide some comments as well? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, Three minutes. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know we're short on time, but, you know, I, I, I do believe and I think we can all agree that words matter as well, right? And so yes. I think the fact that... Um, you know, you've made comments on your opinion of the fact that some of these books meet the Miller test. Quite frankly, I think um, will necessitate Allison speaking a little bit about the Miller test because we also want to make sure, you know, that the headline tomorrow, you know, isn't city council, you know, thinks these books are against the Miller test, right? And so we need to be careful about that. And I'm gonna, I want to ask Allison to brief, to briefly talk about that if, if it's okay with you. I also think it's important that we, and I know you all do, but for the purpose of, you know, those tuning in, distinguish, you know, which books we're referring to, right? I mean, as, as was alluded two weeks ago, right, there are books that you've been provided that have not gone through the process, right? And so to just generally assume that every single book that somebody might be referring to in their mind, you know, is A, in the library, which it may or may not be, and B, may or may not have already gone through a process, right? And to give the library advisory board an opportunity to actually review it. And obviously we don't have the time to actually go through every single book, but I think it's important that as part of your conversations, you know, you take that into account, hence the information that we've provided you in the past as a resource to be able to help you discern that, right? Um, the other thing that I think is important too to keep in mind is, you know, the conversation started with hopefully some consensus around direction for staff. I would argue that the Library Advisory Board deserves the same um, attention. Um, the Library Advisory Board are your appointees. They're the ones that, per current policy, are tasked to ultimately adopt this policy. And as you know, they've been working on this for 
all year, right? And we do have a library advisory board meeting tomorrow where this policy is on the agenda. And I think it would be appropriate to not only have direction for staff, but potentially direction to your appointees as to how you would like for them to proceed um, with this conversation. Um, and so if we want to talk about, you know, what are some takeaways from today's conversation, I think it's that, is what are your expectations of the library advisory board as your appointees, especially since they've been having this conversation and have a meeting tomorrow. Um, but then also that everybody truly understand what these definitions are. Um, and since you've talked about them, I think Allison needs to talk about them for a few minutes as well. All right. Good evening, Mayor and Council. So each of you has the uh, PowerPoint that I presented previously in your packets that you can kind of follow. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I know it's getting late this evening. Um, so many of you have referenced the Miller test, which we've discussed previously. I'm going to hit the, the high points of that. That's the, the test used by the courts. It's been around since 1973 to determine whether or not something is considered obscene. Um, it's a three-prong test, and I'm going to go through each prong very briefly. Prong one is whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient, prurient interests. As I've pointed out, the key part of that prong is taken as a whole. So you have to consider the entire book or the entire work. Prong two is whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct or excretory functions as specifically defined by applicable state law. Prong three is whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So those are the three prongs of the Miller test. And um, when you're talking about the Miller test, you have to, what courts have said is that because it's three prong, there's different standards that apply to each prong. They have said that prongs one and two are, are a community standard, which I know is very important to the, the council, what our community standard is. Um, prong three, however, is set as a national standard. So that's the prong where you take into consideration what would be considered a national standard. Um, to be obscene, it must be shown that the average person applying contemporary community standards and viewing the material as a whole would find all three prongs of the Miller test have been met. So that means that in order for something to be obscene, it must meet all three prongs. Again, I believe, and Dana can correct me if I'm wrong, that the books that the books that have been reviewed have gone through the Miller test by the Libra Library Advisory Board. They 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 know what it is. They're aware of it. They understand it as well. Um, so, to determine if material is obscene, it must be the predominant theme or purpose of the material, meaning that. Um, the main or principal thrust of that material when assessed in its entirety and by its total effect, not by incidental themes or isolated passages or sequences. It's important to remember that all of these tests, you have to look at the book as a whole um, and not just specific sentences, words, chapters, so on and so forth. Is What is the entire book about? What is it saying? Um, what's its theme? What does it portray? You have, have a question? question. Yes, sir. Yes. The Miller test itself, is, was that directed towards adult books, children's books, all books? All books. So what's obscene to an adult versus a child, there's no difference? Uh, based on your community standard as well as the national standard, yes. Is this a Supreme Court case or is it a Ninth Circuit? Uh, that's Supreme Court. Okay. Um, I can get into each of the prongs more in depth. Um, you do have the information in front of you if you want me to. Uh, mm. I don't know how far y'all want me to go with this. We can come back and discuss it more at the next meeting after you've had time to think about it. And I know this is yep. a continuing conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been referencing it throughout and when we were having citizens comments and I would, didn't take my comments lightly in saying that I felt that a number of these books don't pass the Miller test, they have not all gone through, like Mr. Garza said, the process of review. Um, that's why I asked at the last meeting that, you know, please get these started through the review process. And if um, someone wishes me to put them in for review, I don't have a problem doing that as well if you don't want to. So, Well, secondly, though, um, because Mr. Garza asked for some type of direction for the library review board, our library advisory board, um, and it is kind of what we've said here about having some alternate policies for younger, for books for younger children. Uh, because if we have policies that are strong enough 
then we don't have to worry about these books being on the shelves and meeting the Miller's test, Miller test as to whether they can be removed or not. It's Mr. Crocker said, not all books that are written have to be in our library. And so I think that uh, we could uh, take a stronger look at what's coming in to begin with as opposed to taking a look at the books that we have. Lost my mic. And as we've discussed, there's there's definitely a different standard when it comes to determining what comes in versus what's already in and what you're going to be removed and why it's going to be removed. So those are definitely two different things for y'all to consider with this particular issue. Let me see if I can restate what you said. I think if I was to say that what I heard from everybody up here was that the library staff and library advisory board develop some more uh, detailed policy, collection policies that deal with age groups by what is appropriate content for those age groups that deal with mental development of, you know, a child. Anybody want to tack on or is that kind of what we're saying? And that's one portion of it? Mm -hmm. I think so. And I know, Mr. Lofgren, you don't agree, and that's, no, that's, I, I, that's I just, okay. I just I see great difficulty. <clears throat> it's not an it easy shouldn't, task. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be that it shouldn't be tried, but I just see great difficulty. Yep. Um, so that would be one direction. I know it's not an easy one. I think that there are um, willingness up here to try and help the process along, but separate policy collection or collection policies for each appropriate age group and content appropriate material, not just reading level, would be kind of what I'd take from tonight if the library advisory board's meeting tomorrow. How many new books are brought in and how often are they brought in? Like in the juvenile section or the children? How often? I can tell you that annually. We add around between 10,000 and 12,000 items a year. Is that all, all items? All books, all ages. But is that just books or is that books all and materials, tapes? And all materials. All materials. All, all library materials. How and we many, can obviously get the information and break it down in more Yeah, detail. how many aren't adult? Is okay, what I'm I would have to um, ask okay. for the department to, to look into that. Right. Dana, since you're up there, let me ask you yes. a question. The reviews that you said the teachers, librarians, and other professionals do of the books, are they like um, a weighted a number, or are they looking, I mean, do you know what they use to categorize books or to rate them or to review them? They're written reviews, so they're... They're just like reading a review like you'd read in a newspaper or a review of a book. It may tell you a little bit about what the author is known for, what the topic is, um, kind of whether they cover that subject area very focused or broadly. Um, I mean, Does it refer review. to the age group that they're there is, talking there, to or written or uh, writing to? Okay, I'm not understanding exactly what okay, you're asking. Okay, just like a speaker, when they're going to talk to an audience, they have to think of their audience, what intellectual level they're at. So in these reviews, are they taking into account the intellectual level of the person reading the book? Is that part of the review or not? I mean, I would say the intellectual level, they're not stating this is for an intellectual level at this And their age, age level, so they wouldn't know. But they're they, just writing the book. It's not for uh, an adult. It's not for uh, a juvenile or, you know, it's just written. There's no, in the review, it doesn't state who it's written for. It might say, you know, this, this is a picture book, like format. So that means to us in, like, professional terms, that it has lots of pictures, few words. They might say this is a chapter book, possibly, or they put them in sections, possibly, that say chapter books. Miss Elise, 
Are you asking whether the, the ratings or the reviews give you a G, PG, PG-13, NC-17 type of rating? Something like that? No. So nobody knows when you go pick up a book and there's a review on there, you don't know what age group. So how do you determine what age group you put it in? We, um, you want to speak on that at all? I mean, the, the journals themselves will say like children's nonfiction, but it may mean children from babies to you know, whatever we have the upper limit of children, all in that area of the journal. So you're reading reviews by format, like board book, picture book, chapter book. Um, but determining that it's for a specific age, like I said before, we don't say this is a book for a 10-year-old, so only a 10-year-old can look at it. We don't, like, set it that specific. So what makes you put it in the children's section and not in the adult section? Um, mainly it's the format of it. For example, um, that it is a chapter book that is not at one of those higher, like we said, Lexile levels. That's one standard we might look at um, that we can tell by the way it looks when it comes in, when we flip through it, that that format is for a children's chapter book, a juvenile chapter book, versus an adult book. If you look at an adult book, you'll see that it has a lot more words. The way the book is formatted is very differently. We look at the subject headings. I mean, we look at all the different reviews, and they might give us a hint in that review that this was written for grade school level. Grade school could mean anything from kindergarten up through sixth grade, fifth grade. So. It's not like a very specific, this book is only for 10-year-olds. Yeah, and therein, I think, lies the problem. Right. Yeah. So I can we, see we where the problem is. You know, it's, it, I, I wouldn't be able to categorize anything that way, you know, because if I'm the one that has to decide, mm -hmm. then the responsibility falls on me. And we do have our software system has a really nice... Um, information in it on each title. So if you look up a title in our system, you can read the subject headings on that book. You can read the, the like they'll have like a little blurb on that book. So that's one quick way to know kind of the content of that material. That's my problem with not having the Dewey Decimal System. Yes. You have to know the name of the book to look it up to get the information or you wander into that section. But as it is, you're just wandering down the... the mm -hmm. And okay. so, Dana, so if I had anything about pro appropriately putting from a contact, uh, content standpoint from a rating, can we find some rating system? I think we should keep looking for that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give up. The, no. It may be hard, right. and that's fine, when but it, I, don't, I think it's, it's a worthwhile goal. Yeah. Okay. Is that... Is that yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to ask a Dana question. Miss Dana Williams. You said that the, the, the material is uh, 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 reviewed at the national level and at the local level, correct? Where did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, item is reviewed at the national level and the local level? The books are reviewed here locally, but, but it also comes with a, a review from uh, when they put uh, them on a the national uh, level or something like that. Um, local reviews, I don't know what that would be i mean unless they wrote a review in the news the victoria advocate of a book who, who reviews the books locally for you i think i think we're talking about i think you're asking formal reviews right and yes. dane that's why dana's response is well we don't have somebody locally that does these formal reviews you know and jot and writes them down you know the way that she's referring to reviews that are written by you know educators you know etc right if that's your question there you're isn't that level of review if if you if you mean who's reviewing the books as simply as like who's literally looking at the book when it comes in, that's different. Right. Is that your question? Yes. That would be our staff. Okay. As they come in. So yeah. The, 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 so the they're unpacked have and a standard guideline that, that they follow, like guideline one, two, three, four. We ABCD. follow our policy, our collection development policy. Okay. Okay. Everybody. And okay, I know. Well, yes, ma'am. There was just one other thing that um, 
was brought up to me by my assistant director, Jessica, is that we use a system called OCLC. It's an industry standard across the world. Um, we use it mainly, we've used it in the past for cataloging materials, but it provides us a lot of information and libraries all over the world use it as well to determine the cataloging. So that's the location of items that helps us as well. What's it called again? OCLC WorldCat. Um, OCLC. And what so. does cataloging an item mean? That determines where it's located in the building. Okay. So you talked about the Dewey Decimal System. Mm -hmm. So that's one portion of it that um, you also have fiction books that you put under the author's last name. So your Dewey Decimal is usually your nonfiction. And that was the what you were speaking about earlier was having like that area. Like there is an area that is the Dewey Decimal number for human sexuality. Okay. But the Dewey Decimal System doesn't apply to every book, right? Right. So that's, that's why correct. they have right. to find different Make ways decisions. to do it. And that's for nonfiction? For nonfiction. For nonfiction is what they call that. Nonfiction. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate some of these are. Yeah. So do you have enough fiction from us tonight? Do we not confuse you more for library advisory board or library staff? Ron, I think it's a conversation that is ongoing. You know, I think I, I think so too. So, I think we're we're closed on any decision or anything. I think there's close. kind of a consensus to really look at uh, collection policy development and age appropriateness content coming into the library, um, and how we get there. I'm not going to define tonight and get through those details, but possibly another session. Yeah, possibly yeah. another section still on the table. They haven't worked through that one totally. But I think that's where we leave it tonight. And uh, again, thank you for, to everybody that uh, came out tonight to uh, participate in the discussion and uh, give us your thoughts on each, each side of the issue. Um, thank you again to the council members for good positive discussion. Um, very respectful and I appreciate it. Okay, any other items from council? You all are welcome to stay. <laughs> yeah. This may be Good a stuff record. coming up. <laughs> Sidewalks. <laughs> Thought I'd throw that out there for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. With that, we will close items from council. We're going to skip over four again and go to a consent agenda. Ms. Hilbrick, will you help us out, please? <laughs> Item D1 is the adoption of minutes of the regular meeting held on August 2nd, 2022. Item D2 is a resolution authorizing a grant application to the Lone Star operation in an approximate amount of 787,000 and designating the city manager as the authorized official. And item D3 is a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contract with Sweetwater Energy Solutions LLC of Victoria, Texas for solar lighting at the Green Ribbon Project in the amount of $74,415.30. I'll move for approval of the consent agenda items D1 through 3. A second. Okay, thank you. Got a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, motion carried. Item E1. Item E1 is a resolution appointing or reappointing members to the Planning Commission. Sorry, I had to switch places there. <laughs> So um, tonight, the resolution before you will appoint or reappoint members to the Planning Commission. So the terms of the planning, uh, the planning commission is composed of nine members that serve three-year terms that are staggered, and the commissioners may not serve more than two consecutive three-year terms. <clears throat> The current members of the board are Brian Rokita, Brian Nogin, Vic Caldwell, Gail Hode, Cynthia Staley, Dr. Derek Hunt, Victor Mendoza, Dan Mikalinka, and Monica Rodriguez. The terms of three members will expire later this month, and the new terms will end in August 2025 of the appointments that we're doing tonight, and two of the current members wish to be reappointed or are eligible uh, to be reappointed. One of the current members is not eligible, that's Ms. Gail Hode, due to her term limits. So we received several applications and they were included in your packet for consideration. Cynthia Staley and Dr. Derek Hunt do wish to be reappointed and are eligible. The other applicants, excuse me, the other applicants were Braden Robertson, Stephen Kidder, Rebecca Spears, David Brown, and Mark Hinojosa. 
So before the meeting, ballots were placed at the dais. Uh, they include your names already. And I would ask that you, because you can't vote by secret ballots, I would ask that you circle the name of the three applicants that you wish to appoint to the commission. If there are not three clear uh, winners, then we will vote again between the applicants with the most votes. So Sandra is going to come around and pick up your ballots as they're ready. Well, so I say, uh, I want to thank Dr. Hunt for being here today. I know he had to leave, but he was here earlier. be just a moment while we tally the votes, but I do want to announce that the ballots are available in my office for review. Should have started the meeting by saying that there is no Chick Fil A tonight. Oh, so then that, I that would have been a ten-minute discussion while ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, believe it or not, we do have three clear um, winners. So, um, Ms. Cynthia Staley, Dr. Derek Hunt, and David Brown received the most votes. Great. So, so th their names will be entered on the resolution. Do you like to make a motion? I so move that we appoint uh, or reappoint Cindy <laughs> Staley and Dr. Derek Hunt and David Brown to fill in the positions for the Planning Commission. Thank you. Second. Okay. Motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Just to thank you to all those that did apply. Uh, we appreciate your willingness to serve and continue uh, asking for you to Keep, Send, keep, keep the applications coming. Um, there's more positions that are always available. Um, just because you weren't selected on this one doesn't mean that you wouldn't be on another one. So thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All right. All right, so we've this got uh, two, yeah, two city manager reports. We promise they will be uh, quick-ish. Um, but the first is an update on a few public art projects initiatives, and to kick that off, uh, Kate Garcia, Main Street Manager, is going to come up. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I promise to keep it short. <laughs> short yet informative. Um, tonight we present an update on public art projects. These projects are um, driven by community input and documents such as the downtown master plan. Um, my clicker, here we go. <laughs> Departments involved in planning and, implement and implementation are primarily M Main Street Program, Keep Victoria Beautiful, and the Convention Visitors Bureau. One of these projects is the Crosswalk Art. You've probably seen it reported in the Victoria Advocate a few months ago um, and more recently in a press release by our Public Information Office earlier today. Um, this is a project that will um, have art in nine east-west facing crosswalks downtown that will be painted with custom designs that reflect culture, history, and arts of Victoria. The Victoria Fine Arts Association is the spearheading organization that we're helping facilitate this project with. Um, they've secured funding for all nine crosswalks. Art will be installed from the 20th to the 26th of August, beginning at 9 p.m. each evening in order to um, kind of stay out of the way for safety of their artists um, at times of least amount of traffic through the area. Uh, an engraved paver acknowledging each sponsor will be placed near every crosswalk. And I would like to also mention that we are getting help from the Public Works Department uh, to restripe the crosswalks that will have the art installed on them to make them look nice, fresh, and pearly white. Thank you, Ken. 
So as you'll see, here's a map of the crosswalks around downtown. Um, I won't list all of them, but each little purple dot is where they'll be placed. Most of them are around De Leon Plaza, one up by the library, and some down further toward uh, Santa Rosa Street. And here are some uh, mock-ups, some 3D uh, image renderings that will show you. These are the designs that will be installed on these nine crosswalks, as well as more of the designs. Um, that music bar up in the top right corner is actually Willie Nelson's On the Road Again. So we're really excited to see some musicians get out there and try and play those opening bars. Um, I would like to note that all crosswalks were privately funded again through donations to the Victoria Fine Arts Association. Um, art will be facilitated by Josh Vega with the Free Arts uh, Victoria program. He's done some work with us before, um, so he's, we're excited to partner with him again. Um, and I would also like to give a special thank you to the Victoria Fine Arts Association. They presented this idea to the Main Street program approximately two to three years ago. So it's been a long, hard haul for them. And uh, so I'd like to thank them for their time and resources on this project. Um, some upcoming uh, programs and initiatives and events that we have for this uh, public arts project is the Viva Texas Film Festival. This will be September 16th through the 18th. Um, and in conjunction with this, we'll also have our quarterly art walk. Um, that has been a program that's been around for mm, a couple of years. And also a new, again, Victoria Fine Arts Association program, uh, the Music Walk. So all three, the film festival, the art walk, and the music walk will all occur on that Saturday the 17th. Other programs include electrical box wrap project um, that we're working with the Convention Visitors Bureau on and the public art initiative that you see the armadillo down there. That is just an example. We haven't settled on a, a specific animal or design yet, but that is an art initiative uh, primarily spearheaded by the Main Street Program Board. Um, they're trying to put together a program that will span a few years, uh, it'll be a fundraising mechanism for that Main Street Board. Um, so we'll look forward to having more details as they get further down that planning process to present to you. And with that, I will turn it over to Christy for your uh, community appearance, Katie B. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, to follow up um, what Main Street is doing, you've been hearing a little bit in the past about the public art mural project, and we're ready to get going on that uh, coming up soon. Um, as you remember, or you might not remember, but we've got this, um, we're gonna focus on the Laurent Street underpass, which is that whole strip there. And it's heavily trafficked, as you know, and it's an expansive area. And we're narrowing in on this so we can cover the entire area, not just pick out spots. If you pick out spots, sometimes the spot next to it looks really bad. <laughs> so we're going to just do the whole thing and really make it, it pop. Um, what you see up there, and I'll, I'll give you the timeline in just a second, we have uh, selected a... Um, uh, artist team up art studio that will be doing this work for us after we did um, an RFQ and we selected them. They were the sole bidder. They also project manage. They're out of Houston and they are, they are really turning out to be a good team. What you see up there, those three images are just examples of their work in other places that were relevant. So this is in other areas. You can get a sense of some of the things, uh, some of the things they've done. Um, this is just the timeline. Um, and in July, we selected a BART studio. Um, we are now in the process of the design. And you might have uh, received a survey uh, from me uh, related to this. And this design process is getting themes together to provide to the artist team. So then they will put some mock-ups together that we will get out to the public. So we'll actually get public input on this, but first we just wanna get the themes together to give to the artists. Does that make sense? 
Okay, so there's some little questions. We do have a, a committee that we put together with city staff um, as well as um, Key Victoria Beautiful um, and some representation from Crossroads Art House as well, just to get the themes going. Uh, we anticipate the end of September getting these mock-up designs out um, and then October uh, we'll select the final design, finalize that contract. We do not have a contract with them. We just have this RFQ. So we're working with them on that process now. And we want to get that done. We anticipate um, presenting that to council in November. Project start date will be early spring. We are working with... Um, Local, our local artists, and I know that was a concern from the beginning, and one of our, our important things that were a part of this whole RFQ, and we've already connected, connected them um, as well. So that's, that will be a big part of this. And we anticipate this being a part of the bicentennial, of course, so it will be done well in time for that. And I also want to remember to thank Councilwoman Solis, because I think she was one of the first ones to bring this project up. And I think it's just about to happen. So. <laughs> Great. That's what I Can we get some roses in there? Because we used to be the city of roses somewhere. Uh, no, I, we've, we've had that suggestion. So fill out that survey. OK. Uh, I need it back by Friday, because I need to get it to the artists. OK. Um, anything else on that? No. Okay, I'm going to turn this over to Joel real quick. That's a great picture. That one's really neat. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excited for this project. Yeah. Very neat. Mayor and Council, thank you for your time this evening. I just have one slide to talk about the CVB's uh, contributions to our public arts uh, in Victoria. Um, so uh, we have, you know, recognized some opportunities to help some of our other departments and enhance their events. Um, primarily through the, the rain, vein, vein of live music. Uh, you know, we are a Texas music-friendly certified community through the Office of the Governor. Um, about a year ago, recognized an opportunity to uh, join with the, the Main Street with their tunes at noon for the Market on Main, VPL Jams, uh, to provide payment for musical artists. You know, a lot of musicians nowadays, um, it's don't play for free. <laughs> it's hard to get artists to play for free. Uh, what you do if you continue to ask that, you're going to kind of get the same artists over and over again. Uh, so we do provide payment for the artists for the tunes at noon for the Market on Main, and it's a modest amount, about $100 or so for an hour-long live set. Uh, that happens a couple of times a year with the tunes at noon, as well as the market on Main. Um, it can go up a little more depending if it's a larger group, especially if we're going to bring in, you know, for a good example, we brought in a mariachi group for October last year uh, for their market on Main event. Uh, and then the monthly VPL Jam series, and we work with them uh, routinely, uh, and that's uh, held a little more frequently, but work with them routinely to set up a, you know, a metric for how much they charge uh, depending on the type of artist that it is. So we've been we've seen success with that. We've seen the increase uh, attendance at the tunes at noon. Uh, we have worked closely with them to provide, you know, seating out there, bag chairs that are available to borrow, ideas for bringing in local uh, food vendors like Chick Fil A. So uh, how to enhance those events uh, in downtown Victoria? We're we're very big on that on our department is an event enhancement, not just only with the city, but uh, outside the city, but within our other city departments as well. Um, we also uh, partner with the Main Street program uh, and the Downtown Art Walk to provide the trolley and shuttle service uh, that is available during the all of the Art Walk events. Um, to uh, just ease of use and get people to all the venues. Uh, so we've seen great success with that. Have people been using that? Yes, yeah, so we have about 200 riders or so per, per event, which okay. is not bad attendance on those, on those trolleys. Um, and we get those numbers. We typically partner with Texas Coast Limousine, who has you know, provided those numbers and keep those counts. Um, we also, uh, you know, Kate, a few minutes ago, mentioned the electrical box wrapping project. That's something that we had started to move forward on. Uh, got a couple of quotes on that, and it would be seven boxes, or seven locations uh, in De Leon Plaza and around City Hall. Uh, we got some work with some local artists, got some uh, co ideas, uh, saw some mock-up art, and uh, we just felt there was maybe some cohesiveness missing, and then we knew the crosswalk uh, art uh, project was coming up very soon. So we put a hold on that because we wanted that crosswalk art project to go in because we want all of that to tie in together. We don't want the art to clash. You don't want it to look all the same and blend into each other, but you don't want some crazy thing on the electrical box and it totally clashes with the crosswalk art that's going on. Uh, so that's still on our radar, but we 
we put that on hold for a while. Uh, and then supporting, uh, you know, Kate mentioned the music walk that's going to be coming up on September 17th. That's a really wonderful weekend for the arts in Victoria. You, you have the Viva Texas Film Fest, the downtown art walk, the music walk. Everybody's going to be really engaged. Uh, we're working to help out the music walk, providing some PA systems. We have a lot of those just internally with different city departments. Simple PA systems because it's going to be primarily solo artist set, sets, those kind of things. Uh, so providing those resources for them to where they can have easy transition between artists. Uh, and we're also looking to, uh, for the Viva Texas Film Fest, do a filming uh, locations site tour in Victoria on that Saturday morning of the event. Use a film festival that's happening as a springboard to uh, convince filmmakers, directors, producers, whoever, to come to Victoria for the weekend and tour our sites. And we talked with the Texas Film Commission. It was an idea they gave us. We've seen other film festivals in cities like Fredericksburg had success with it. Just a Saturday morning where we're showing off our community, uh, pitching it as a place to to have you know filming locations for movies or episodic television. Uh, so uh, we do play an important role. We, we definitely help and tag on with a lot of events that, that Main Street uh, and Economic Development and KVB is putting on. Um, and it's just our you know role of enhancing events and even bringing up new things for the community. Can somebody tell me more about the Viva Texas Film Fest? Sure. sure. Um, like what kind of artists, how, how many films, where are they coming from, where are they going to be shown? I, I, I've missed all the information about it, I guess. Sure. Or maybe it's not settled yet. I can speak to that to a degree. Kate could even speak to me a little, speak to it a little more intimately, but I can give you just the rundown of it. Um, it is a partnership uh, between the Crossroads Art House, Claire Santiana, and, and uh, Carissa Winters of the Innovation Collective. Uh, a very exciting opportunity for our community, uh, highlighting uh, Spanish language films, Latina filmmakers. Uh, it's going to be over three days, so a Friday evening, Saturday, and Sunday, uh, primarily at the Leo J. Walter Center for the performance arts, the house venues being activated as well. Uh, there are some really great opportunities for bringing in some, some big names for this event um, and highlighting uh, the culture of Victoria. And uh, Carissa could probably speak to that. <laughs> I see her walking <laughs> up right now and she could pitch it even better than I can, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's a, a lot of us, our city departments are intimately involved. Myself, uh, Kate, economic development, uh, so there, uh, it's going to be a wonderful event for the community and one that we're looking forward to. So it is um, not, you, you actually, remember we used to have a film festival here, it was an independent film festival. This will have some elements of an independent film festival, but at the same time not. So uh, it's going to be a, a film festival in, encapsulating and not just independent film. Um, yes, and Carissa can speak. If Viva okay. Texas Film Festival sure. dot com. Yes. All right. Yeah. If Carissa, yeah, she's yeah, more than welcome a, to come just up. Just a minute or so sure. to add some. Hi, everybody. Carissa Winters here. So this is a really exciting time. We've already been featured in Variety Magazine. So that was really amazing, as well as the Texas Film Commission. That's huge for a first year film festival. We have Lewis Black involved, who was a founder of South by Southwest. We also have a couple other people, Michael Dunaway. He helped found the Sarasota Film Festival, as well as he's the owner of the Rome Film Festival and other huge film festivals involved. We have Steve Prince. He's a famous producer. He's done Black Swan and other other films as well, and he owns Cross Creek Productions. So we have a powerhouse team that we've brought in to work with us on this. We're really excited because we're also showing filmmakers local from the community, as well as a few who've moved away and done some big things, but they were originally from here. So that's exciting to include the local community. That's big for us to give a platform. We want this to create business, make them make this a film-friendly city, as well as provide a lot of opportunities for local people here, as well as our community. And, you know, create businesses, heads and beds for the hotel tax, all of these wonderful things. And what's great about it is we have a lot of amazing films, some Sundance winners as well as Tribeca. We have a film actually premiering called Americana. They were actually asked to be in Sundance. They turned it down so they could be here. It's someone that I know. We have the number one Harley stunt team in the world performing before the opening of the show. And we also have the actors, one of them being Ruby Modine, Matthew Modine's daughter, who, you know, full metal jacket, Stranger Things, all those. So we are showing Frida. We're going to show Desperado as a throwback films. We have the producer, Sarah Green, of Frida actually coming in town, as well as some other 
famous producers. And then we have more star power and talent coming every day. We find out new names. So it's, it's really exciting for this three day event. And I'm really excited about Saturday where we're tying in, you know, music and art in our community. So this is giving a platform to those local musicians and local artists and, you know, all of the businesses in town, not only downtown, but if you have a business, something that this can benefit you, I've told everyone, just let us know, let's do it. This is about our community as a whole to give a big platform because we are an amazing city. We have such great things. Instead of saying, move here because we're two hours great from something. No, we're great. You come here. So that's, that's a big thing for this film festival. It's more than just film, but we do have a lot of amazing things behind it. Thank you. And thank you. There will be a schedule being published yes. at some point. Yes. Uh, that's on the about website. to come out. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. So again, it's Viva Texas Film Festival.com for more information. Yes. And all that should be going live this week. So great. Thank you. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Are there any other questions that we can address? No. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. So the second city manager report is an update on our broadband effort, and Derek Furrow is going to start this one off. So I'll try to go uh, in the spirit of fast internet. I'll try to go fast. So, <laughs> um, you know, they just so keep if coming. you talk fast, we're going to get a fast internet, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, so I actually do have some folks that are going to help me tonight, and uh, and I'm, we're grateful to have them here. I also want to acknowledge uh, Donald Jarkovsky is here from the UHV Center of Regional for Collab Regional Collaboration. Let me say that correctly. Uh, they're doing a great job regionally and and sort of getting out and helping the places around Victoria as well as being involved in the conversations we're having. Uh, they've also been involved in conversations with uh, Victoria College to create a program that would be an eligible training provider that would couple nicely with the conversations we're having with Henry Cajardo at the Texas Workforce Commission for uh, our Texas Workforce Board for a uh, adding fiber installers and technicians to the target occupation list because we expect to see that going on. And you'll hear today about, you know, upwards of 10 to 15 crews a day currently working and installing fiber all over Victoria already. Um, so the jobs are there, the need is there, and the training opportunities are, are coming. So this is a sort of a preview of, of a, what could come there. Additionally, I just wanted to let you know that we do have available on our website at victoriatx.gov slash broadband uh, a map where any resident can go and enter their address. And the map shows work that's scheduled for the rest of the year, right? So it won't show work that's scheduled into 2023 yet. But both AT&T and Sparklight have provided our GIS folks with data to let them make a map that's searchable. You can enter your address and find out if you're in the blue and AT&T is going to be servicing you. You can enter it and find out if you're in the orange and, and Sparklight will be servicing you. Or if you're in the purple and both will service you. And if as you have as you encounter issues with contractors or as you have questions about, you know, what are they going to do to my flower beds or other things, there are phone numbers that you can call um, for both companies. Uh, Sparklight is 361-433-0056 if you see that you're in the orange on the map. And AT&T is 361-884-8288 if you're in the blue on the map. Uh, so should you have problems, questions, concerns, when can I get fiber, um, both both those numbers you can call and, and talk to them. With that, um, if you don't have any questions for me right away, I'll invite... Uh, Brett Willis, who is not only Vic, uh, Sparklight's new um, general manager, but he's also one of Victoria's newest residents. So we're very happy to have, have Brett here tonight from Sparklight. I have a question for you. Yes, sir. I just jumped on the broadband website. Mm -hmm. um, where do you find a map? It's too slow. Oh, uh, right. I see what you popped up when you said that. <laughs> Scroll what are we down. Using? It's in the middle of the page, really. Okay, it finally popped up. So. Sorry. <laughs> you guys got that? Y'all gonna gonna help out with that? Okay. So. All right. All right. Brett, let's get the city off a of dial up. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. I did make a few notes so I don't get off topic and take the rest of our night. Um, I wanted to start uh, by wishing myself a happy birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> so I hope everybody brought a gift on my way out. Uh, I do mention that as a bit of a more, more of a story. Uh, my wife asked me this morning, said, hey, you know, happy birthday. What do you want to do tonight? Go out to eat, whatever. 
I said, no, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than a city council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, I did say that in jest. Um, and then as I thought about it over the day, um, that really kind of rings home. Um, I moved to Victoria, moved my expecting wife uh, about 1,200 miles, uh, due in about six weeks, uh, with a purpose. Um, we want to expand our lives, much like Spartlight wants to expand the lives of those in Victoria. Uh, our purpose is to connect our customers and communities to what matters most. Uh, between now, roughly August, of course, delays can be expected. Um, I would assume before October of next year, we plan to connect 21 to 22,000 homes to gig by gig service, and that's what we're offering out of the gate. Um, early in January or February of next year, I hope to up that to two gigs. Uh, that's certainly in the in the pipeline. Um, with, of course, expansion plans beyond that. Um, as we go on, connecting people to what matters most grows even deeper in me, of course, being that 1,200 miles away. Uh, my first child on the way. Um, elderly family, uh, three nieces, one who actually texted me. She got her first cell phone while I've been gone um, <laughs> to wish me a happy birthday. Um, but being able to have that, that video interface means so much more now. Um, not only that, uh, remote working opportunities, uh, remote learning opportunities, um, the ability to work, go home at night, and continue your education wouldn't be possible without reliable broadband. And that's something that I've been doing uh, in my short life for about 10 years of it, so a solid, a uh, little better than a third. Um, and it's something that's very important to us. Uh, one of the spark-like differences uh, starts with me and people like me. Uh, we have dedicated local technicians and staff managers to handle everything from top to bottom. I am a decision maker. Um, I make the decisions on what happens in this market based on what Victoria needs and what I feel Victoria needs. Uh, we have a retail store going to be dedicated here. I hope to have under contract by October, but I found that that has been more of a challenge than I expected. Um, but we are certainly well on our way. Um, and we're composed of small and medium-sized cities. We don't have NFL towns. Uh, we don't go after urban markets. In, in this game, it is about density. Um, how many passings can I get for every dollar spent is, is the major thought. Um, we look at it a little bit differently. Um, obviously, we, we have to have some type of return on investment, but we, we, we try to go after what people need the most, uh, who needs it the most. Um, and of course, our tech is second to none. As I mentioned, launching, launching one gig right off the bat is something that, that most do not do. Uh, the state-of-the-art plant, um, from top to bottom, it's all brand spanking new. Uh, walking into the warehouse that we have over on Coffee Street, uh, I encourage everyone to come take a look at it. it it's something um, truly amazing at the amount of material that we have in there. Um, over my 10 years, my, my tech ops manager has been in the business for about 30, uh, and he's never seen the amount of fiber that we have in, sitting in one spot, and it's, it's a very exciting thing. Um, on top of that, we have diverse roots and a, and a ring in town. Um, we've all been plagued by outages. Um, and they do happen time to time. Things happen in, in this world. Um, with that ring, uh, if we were to suffer a cut right outside this building, that's going to take down maybe a third of town versus the entire town, uh, which is something not heard of as often as it should be in, in this world. Um, and beyond that, our, our values I did want to share as well. Um, Sport Life's values is do right by those we serve to drive progress and to lend a hand. Um, last year, we gave $250,000 to nonprofits focusing on STEM learning, which is, again, something that, that we do not see uh, across our market. Um, much as Derek mentioned, too, I, I did want to mention, I encourage everyone to reach out to that 361-433-0056 should they have any issues or questions that rolls to local leaders. Right now, that uh, goes straight to the construction manager. Uh, he oversees every neighborhood that we're currently building into. Um, it's the unfortunate side of the business, but we are going to mess up flower beds. 
Um, occasionally we are going to cut drops, things that aren't located properly. Uh, and we have a, a human on the, on the other end of the line waiting to, to take your call and address your concerns. Um, I've even incur uh, had, had one issue pop up um, where a lady's fence was missing a, uh, a slat and we hadn't made it to the neighborhood yet. Uh, but it's something that we want to go ahead and address and, and we went out and took care of it for her. Um, but I thank y'all all, um, for allowing me the opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, if you can't tell, I'm not much of a public speaker, um, but I appreciate the opportunity to talk to y'all. I look forward to living here. Um, I've enjoyed Victoria for my solid 10 days that I've actually officially been moved. I've been in a hotel for a little while. Um, but please, if you ever have any questions, don't hesitate to, to reach out. I'm right down the road. Thank you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Brett did not tell me that I was holding him hostage this long on his birthday. So <laughs> <laughs> We also do have the, some folks that have come into town from AT&T to join us. We're really grateful for the, uh, the effort and the work they've put in as well. Um, and they've been, been very hands-on. Um, both of these companies have given us the information and, and the trust and flexibility to build that map we showed you. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask uh, Lydia Zapata and some of her coworkers from at and to come and tell us a little more about their project. Good evening, honorable mayor, esteemed city council members, staff and residents of Victoria. at and is pleased and honored to be here. I am Lydia Zapata, Director of External and Legislative Affairs and with me are my colleagues, Todd Tulis, Construction Project Manager, and Leanna Love, our Fiber Execution Manager. I will begin by explaining why we are deploying fiber in your neighborhoods. Fiber is a technology that can handle growth connectivity. We have highly trained engineers and technicians to operate, maintain, and service the network and support customers at the local level. We monitor our network 24-7 and are ready to respond to an, any man-made or natural disaster to ensure City of Victoria stays connected. As one of the largest fiber providers in the nation, we design our network in an integrated fashion to cap, capture all potential growth opportunities to ensure we maximize the utility of every strand of fiber we lay. And as we continue to invest in expanding our network, more of our customers will have access to higher speed broadband services, whether over our wireless network, our fiber network, or a combination of both. As you leave here today, it is my hope that you remember our comments. AT&T is committed to working together with government and other industry leaders to expand affordable access and increase broadband adoption in communities across the state and to help every resident in the city of Victoria have an opportunity to succeed within goal of narrowing the digital divide. I'll leave several handouts uh, with additional information for your use. And with that, I will now turn it over to Todd Tulis our construction project manager. Thank you for your time. Um, first of all, thank you all for having us and, and letting us come and, and talk about, you know, kind of what's happening in Victoria. Um, it, it's, it's nice to work with the, with a city that's, has open arms and, and is willing to work with us and allow us to come into these neighborhoods into the city and 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 do this work which um, I think as you all understand it's 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 intrusive uh, what we have to do to come in and, and lay fiber into neighborhoods where there hasn't been the product um, but I'd also like to thank Derek and and Ken for their cooperation and assistance through the process uh, they've been great to work with you know, we're, we're building all over the, our 22 state footprint, but all over South Texas. And, and I'll tell you, some of my counterparts have a more difficult time doing their job than we do here in, in Victoria, and, and it's much appreciated. 
Um, kind of our process, just a basic overview of what we do um, in my job. Uh, engineering draws a plan. They draw the, the how we're going to go in and serve a neighborhood. And once they distribute that job, it flows to me or, or my coworker who has the same title. And we take those jobs, um, go out, drive the neighborhood, walk the neighborhood, uh, ensure that the build is going to work as designed. And then I order the cable and material that it will take to uh, build that job. Uh, at that point, I, I award it to a contractor. We have two general contractors working in Victoria. It's Quest Communications and Oak Techs. Um, and then I oversee that project throughout construction and, and deal with roadblocks or any issues that may arise as we go through the process. And all the while maintaining, making sure we're maintaining AT&T's quality standards. Once that job is completely placed, it is turned over to our splicing technicians who go out and, and make the connections that are necessary to serve the neighborhood. And um, I think right now, I currently have about 25 projects going on in Victoria. That's 25 neighborhoods that are that are being built out with, with more planned for this year and uh, already been in contact with engineering and, and there's somewhere around that many projects or more scheduled in 23. So it's a big build. And, and if you drive around town, you, you will see a lot of activity, a lot of placing, a lot of aerial crews, uh, buried crews. And um, as Sparklight mentioned, we, the material that's, that's coming into Victoria is, is something I haven't seen. I've been in this, in this general area for about 25 years with AT&T and um, we are all those of us that are employees that that live in the vicinity and the technicians and managers and engineers we're all excited that fiber is being deployed here because uh, it's well overdue um, our complaint process uh, you know we have the local number that was that was shown that's shown on the board right now it's we handle those things quickly and um, we follow up to make sure that that property owner or resident is, is satisfied with our resolution whenever those issues arise. We cut water pipes, um, flower beds get, get disturbed. We do our best to take care of those and, and like I said, we, we give that to the contractor to handle but we do make sure that at the end of the day they, they tell us that they're satisfied with the resolution. So um, again, thank you for your time and uh, appreciate the, the cooperation and the kind of the, the willingness to let us come in and do this work. So, well, thank you to both of y'all for choosing to, oh, you get more to say, okay, come on. I'm so sorry, and then y'all get to go home. Uh, good evening, my name is Leanna Love. I'm part of the fiber execution team for South Texas. So I actually cover Victoria, Corpus, Laredo, and the Rio Grande Valley. So I stay pretty busy and I travel pretty often. Um, I am based out of Corpus, so I worked very closely with uh, the city of Victoria throughout my time with AT&T, which has been nearly about 10 years. I know that y'all city has been waiting for this, so being a part of the process to get to roll it out, I can truly say I am thrilled, I am so excited, and our teams here are so ready to service their community as well. Um, just so that way y'all can kind of have a good understanding of what you're gonna see post-construction, because that's where I get to come in and kind of take advantage of all the fun stuff. So I want you to kind of know just exactly what you're gonna be seeing throughout your community. You are gonna see an increase of my, my retail teams and different channels come out into your communities and it's primarily just to educate the residents of what they're eligible for and what the benefits of our fiber internet are gonna be. Um, one of the first upcoming events that y'all will see with us is gonna be a ribbon cutting that we will be putting together. Um, Lydia will work back with Derek and Derek, I have to say thank you. I know you've been a great uh, support with us working uh, thus far. Um, but we do plan on having a ribbon cutting celebration just as we're very excited to bring fiber to Corpus. So you'll be seeing a party from us on that and that we're excited to share with you. Right after that, you will be seeing a lot of our channels canvassing our neighborhoods. And what that means is they're gonna be in our neighborhoods primarily more in the evening time because we know nobody wants to be outside in the middle of the day. It's a little hot right now. But they're gonna be out passing out flyers and door hangers and just letting those residents know they're eligible for fiber. And then if they're able to set up at that time, they'll help them process that order. Just so that way they know they have a local point of contact between the four locations that we do have here in Victoria. Um, in addition, you're gonna see us have a lot of pop-up events within the city, right? 
right? So we might team up with local businesses and things like that near areas where we're rolling out those fiber optic uh, connections. That way we're able to educate from that perspective as well. In addition to that, you'll kind of see us in your neighborhoods. We do try to make contact with residents and we ask for approval um, for them to basically be a host home is what we refer to them as. And with those host homes, it's kind of a way for us to be centralized in a neighborhood. That way any residents around that particular resident has any questions. It's a little bit more of an easier engagement factor for us where we can say, oh, hey, they're over at John's house. Let's go check them out really quick. And so it's really just our way to be a little bit more personable with the residents of Victoria. Um, know that throughout this process, my teams do lead with customer experience first. So we are really here just to make sure to answer any questions that y'all might have, make sure that those installs get installed as seamless as possible, and then it's a good experience throughout because like everyone has said, we know that y'all have been waiting for this moment for quite some time. Um, so anything that y'all might need from a post-construction standpoint, I will be your point of contact. Daryl has my contact information. So if there's any concerns or anything like that, or if there's anything that you would like AT to be a part of from a city standpoint, we would love to join you at that. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out. We're just a phone call or an email away. But thank you again. Y'all have been an absolute dream to work with. We're very appreciative for it. And we're so excited to roll out our product for the city of Victoria. So thank you. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate y'all, both of y'all's companies, choosing to invest in Victoria. And I know our citizens will be better for it. And uh, really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, and you know, for if you have any questions for either of these groups, they'll be glad to answer those. Um, the clicks are not working, but the next slide just mentions our victoriatx.gov slash broadband. And so if you can be patient and get your internet there, then uh, it'll uh, it'll have information there. Um, and we'll be glad to answer anything. Uh, just for the, re for the record, um, Suddenlink is now Optimum, and we did talk with them about uh, um, trying to give us some construction updates. They weren't able to be here tonight, but they are continuing to expand their nodes, so reducing the number of customers on on a node um, in contrast to the fiber to the home approach. So. Okay. Thank and one you. last thing, Mayor, if you don't mind really quickly, this, because um, I know I know we got to wrap up, but I think it's important to mention that all this started with an effort to make broadband and internet more affordable, reliable, and accessible. And as you know, this has been a priority for council to the point where we've even considered building a middle mile to ensure that we reach all our residents. And I think it's important to convey publicly that um, from our understanding, you know, the, both of the companies that you've heard from tonight are committed to doing that, committed to building fiber throughout our entire community so that even, even in areas that were of priority for us, you know, are addressed. Um, and so I think it's important to, to, to say that out loud. Um, and I hope they're all head nodding behind me because, you know, that's been part of the conversation and we obviously will continue to work with them to ensure that that actually happens. Yep. Thank you okay. for that reminder. Both companies are part of the affordable connectivity program and do offer uh, services that would be available to folks that may qualify for those, those programs. And as you see on the map, at and is already sort of spreading out and Sparklight has indicated a commitment to do the same. Okay. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. Um, so we're going to take uh, probably a 10 minute recess and then we will reconvene into uh, executive session. So 8 uh, 12, please. Ms. Hilbert. The City Council will recess for executive session on the 16th day of August 2022 at 8 02 p.m. The subject matter of the executive session deliberation is as follows. Um, Executive session in accordance with Texas Government Code 551.087, 551.072, and 551.071. Okay.